Welcome. This video was created for people who need to sleep or just relax. Please remember that there are only three ads in this video after the first three stories, and then the rest of the video will be ad free. And before the stories begin, I have a big announcement. Chilling is evolving, and next year, in addition to the stories we already feature, we will be releasing movies, short horror films, series, and chilling originals. And I'm very excited to show you the teaser trailer to a chilling exclusive film coming out next year. Written and directed by Daniel Alexander, I give you Gale. Stay away from Oz. It feels like it knows me. Like it's calling me. How long has this been happening? Ever since I found her. Your grandmother is. And what did you say her name was? Dorothy. Dorothy Gale. Come back. I didn't know she had any family. Neither did I. She hasn't said a word in years. I'm afraid a lifetime of psychosis has really taken its toll on her. Can I? Sure. Hi. Dorothy? It's Emily. I'm your granddaughter. <gasps> Stay away from us. 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 I hope you're as excited as me, and if you want to get involved, and even become a producer, check out our investment campaign. I'll leave the link in the description to this video. Now, let's begin. As luck would have it, I inherited a crappy piece of property in my early 30s when an uncle passed away. I know that sounds ungrateful, but if you had seen it, you would have laughed just like the rest of my family did. They teased me with countless haunted stories, due to the fact that the property was in a wooded area in the middle of nowhere. I decided that I might as well go out and take a look one weekend, but no one was available to go with me. Mom was afraid for me and made me promise to call every night, seeing as I left Friday afternoon, and planned to come back on Saturday. I drove a van, so I had decided that I would sleep in it, even though there was a self-contained cabin there. Unlucky for me, I was advised that there was no running water, but I had already resigned myself to fixing the place up and selling it even if I got a low price for it. When I pulled up to the driveway on the four-acre property, I felt shivers going down my spine. 
I couldn't put my finger on why that happened, but I ignored it and continued to drive. The trees were so thick that I imagined myself getting lost, but soon I saw the cabin, which seemed too new to be in these shabby surroundings. There were a couple of abandoned old cars and a haphazard pile of rotting wood near the shed, which was next to the cabin. When I got out of my car, I felt icicles running through my veins. Maybe it was nerves, but I was sure I saw a shadow in the woods. I felt stupid, but I called out. Hello? Of course, nothing was there, and the shadow disappeared. I actually thought it might have been a bear, so I raced to the front door and fiddled with the keys, eventually unlocking the door and letting myself in. There was no furniture apart from an old table and only one old chair. It was obvious that my uncle started doing the place up, but his death intervened. Thinking of him, I worried that his ghost might be haunting the cabin. Little did I realize at the time, the scariest things were to happen outside. I started to wonder if I would stay at all, but found myself dragging my bags and air mattress in. I sat at the table and ate a makeshift meal, making mental notes about what I had to do to get the place ready for sale. Then I heard a metallic noise not far from the back door. I couldn't be sure, but it sounded like a knife or axe being sharpened. Fair enough, I do have an overactive imagination, but the sound was very real to me. Haunted stories usually don't scare me one bit, but when I looked out the back window, there was nothing to see at first. As soon as I moved to go back to the table, something caught my attention out of the corner of my left eye. I gasped when I turned back and saw what I thought was a huge, hulking silhouette staring at me from the edge of the woods. It was too small to be a bear, but why would there be a person out here in the middle of nowhere? I moved over to the window and had a second look, but it was gone. I could have kicked myself for not bringing a weapon with me. I didn't even have a multi-tool gadget. Even though I am female and was quite tough at the time, I had been a tomboy all my life. I always had tools on me, but all I had at the time was a flashlight. Deciding not to be brave, I stayed in the cabin and wrote notes in my journal. I froze when I heard the metallic sound again. This time I was sure that it was inside the cabin. I got up and nervously crept around, saying, Who's there? Believe me when I tell you that I jumped out of my skin when a shadow walked past the window. The frightening thing was, I couldn't tell if the shadow had been in the front of the window or outside. In a panic, I ran over to the window and once again, I saw a huge silhouette closer to the cabin, but still at the edge of the woods. Rooted to the spot, I stared and barely blinked, trying my best to see if it was real. It seemed like hours went past, but eventually, I had to blink. When I did, the shadow disappeared. I really thought a crazy man was watching me, and I decided that I had to leave. But what if he was waiting for me outside? I gathered up my things and ran to the front door, but I stopped when I heard something fall over in the next room. Was he inside? I had no way of knowing and I did not want to find out. I opened the door and ran as fast as I could to the car. I was so grateful when the engine started immediately. While driving off, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I swear, I could still see the outline of a person. But when I slowed down for one last look, they were gone. It might sound odd, but I actually gave the property away to my dad, who hasn't had any issues there at all. When I was a young kid, I experienced sleep paralysis a couple of times, but it didn't bother me. The first time I didn't even know it was happening, I just laid there thinking until I drifted back to sleep. The second time I realized I couldn't move, but I wasn't scared. 
just thought it was very strange. In my 20s, it happened about five times over a period of a month. The first time I had a feeling of dread and of being watched, but saw nothing in the room with me. Second time, there was a shadowy figure standing in my closet. It just watched me and never moved. And again, I had that feeling of dread, but more intense. I say shadowy because that's how I thought of it, and the shadow man is one of the most common things encountered during sleep paralysis, along with the hag and the black cat. But when I think back and envision it, I don't think it was actually a figure made of shadow. It was more like my eyes simply couldn't focus on it. It was vague, like something in my peripheral vision even though I was looking directly at it. The third time it was standing at the foot of my bed again, just staring at me. I couldn't see its eyes or any other features, but I felt its gaze fixed on me. This was early 90s, so the internet wasn't really a thing and I had never heard of anyone having this kind of experience. I was terrified. Eventually I drifted back to unconsciousness. The next time it happened, the figure was standing beside the bed by my feet, and I was in extreme terror. Unable to move, only watch as this horror unfolded. And this time, it was moving. Very slowly, like a slow motion blur in the shape of a human. It gradually raised its right knee and placed it on the bed next to my frozen legs. This was beyond fear. Beyond terror. I couldn't call out or make any sound. I felt like I couldn't even breathe. It slowly started leaning towards me, and I woke up bathed in sweat and hyperventilating. In the days between these experiences, I thought about it a lot and what I should do the next time it happened. I had decided that if I couldn't wake up, I should try to focus on moving some part, any part of my body, in the hope that I could somehow work myself back into animation. With the final occurrence, as I became conscious but unable to move, the thing was kneeling on my chest, ever so slowly leaning toward me. This was the most primal, intense terror I have ever felt in my life. As it moved its face closer and closer to mine, it felt like pulses of burning white ice, each one stronger as they coursed up my spine. The closer it got, the more I could almost see its features, but never anything quite distinct, just the impression of eyes burning into mine, and a leering malevolence that suggested the grin of a skull. Somehow I remembered to try to move, to focus all of my awareness on my moving hand. I concentrated on closing my fingers into a fist. The thing's face now filled my vision, and I channeled all of my fear into the effort to move my fingers. As I stared into what should have been its eyes, I could almost discern something there. As if across a great distance of blackness, I could make out two tiny clusters of murky red sparks. And then it happened. As I just felt that the tip of one finger was about to move, a strange vertigo washed over me. This became a tingling numbness as my perspective twisted sideways. I felt my upper body sliding over the side of the bed and hanging diagonally down to the floor. But when I looked up to the bed, I saw myself lying paralyzed, still in the bed staring wide-eyed at that horrible thing. And instantly I was back in the bed fully awake, lurching upright with my fist clenched in front of me. Now I have to say I don't really believe in the paranormal anymore. I love stories about it, and I am open to the possibility but with something like this, I just have to say I don't know what really happened. I make this qualification because while this was the last time I experienced sleep paralysis, it is not the end of the story. A few years later, I awoke from a nap next to a girl I was dating. She was still asleep, so I got up and drove to a convenience store to get some chips and drinks. As I returned, I pulled up to my house and saw that she was sitting on the front porch. She was pale and shivering. I asked her what was wrong. She said that she had awoken to find me gone and herself unable to move. 
This was the same bedroom I had my experiences, though now I had a futon on the other side of the room, and I had not told her about my sleep paralysis episodes. And as she had laid there, there was this thing that seemed to be made of shadow. Not a humanoid, but some kind of beast walking on all fours, pacing back and forth around the bed, staring at her, and snarling. During the 70s, Alexandra did her own share of partying, along with her other fellow co-eds, during her college days. She traced the outlines of the party scene, and that of course led to her to make party acquaintances and associations. A part of the 70s scene and leftover free-spiritedness from the 60s led to a lot of hitchhiking and relying on the kindness of strangers, as well as your own ability to judge a character whenever you accepted a ride from them. Alexandra and her party acquaintance friend found themselves waiting for a bus at a city bus stop one day. They had been waiting for about 10 minutes when a young man pulled over and offered the two young co-eds a ride instead of waiting. Even Alexandra, with her caution towards strangers, was tempted to accept his offer. Her feet hurt from a particularly long day and week, and she was tired. Her friend, however, readily accepted the ride, turning back to Alexandra to see if she was coming also. However, whilst not breaking eye contact with a seemingly kind stranger, Alexandra politely declined his offer. So, Alexandra waved goodbye to her friend and waited for her bus as the man pulled back into traffic, driving her friend away with him. Life went on as usual for Alexandra after she caught her bus and got on with the rest of her day, since she didn't really speak to that friend often. College exams and life in general occupied Alexandra's mind. Before she knew it, college was over for her and the years passed quickly. It wasn't until just recently that Alexandra saw her old college buddy appear on her TV screen. But to Alexandra's horror, she quickly realized that she was seeing her friend's college picture displayed, along with Ed Kemper's other murder victims. Alexandra was totally shocked upon realizing her friend's fate. She felt guilty that she didn't try to stop her friend from going with him. But her friend had caught free rides dozens of times and felt that she was a good enough judge of character. Not only that shocked Alexandra, though, but also the fact that she herself had looked into serial killer Ed Kemper's eyes that fateful day. Between May of 1972 and April 1973, Ed Kemper committed several brutal murders. Most of his victims were college co-eds, but what makes Ed's case different is the fact that at just 15 years old, the first two victims he claimed were his own grandparents. After that, he went on to take the lives of six innocent co-eds. He ended his brutal killing spree when he murdered his own mother and her best friend. Ed's killing methods varied from shootings, stabbings, and even strangulation. He liked to cruise around in his car and choose his co-ed victims, and then offer them a ride. The innocent young co-eds that accepted his act of kindness had no idea that that would be the last ride they would ever accept from a stranger. I'm sure that a lot of you hearing this out there understand that you always question what you could have done differently in order for that person to still be alive today. But to me, at least, the truth behind deaths by murder may simply come down to a matter of wrong place, wrong time. For example, I have heard of a case of three women murdered out in Yosemite by Carrie Stainer several times, and from different angles. In one account, I believe that it was said that Carrie actually originally intended to kill another woman he had been seeing and also her children. Apparently, she wasn't home when he went to try and execute his deadly plan. So allegedly, as a result, he happened to have spotted the three female visitors of Yosemite on their way out of their hotel, where Carrie Stainer worked as a maintenance man. If one of those three women would have just taken a few seconds longer to leave the hotel room, 
Maybe they all would have waded back, and Carrie never would have spotted them. It's just a theory, but to me, that part of reality is truly terrifying. Please, everyone, stay safe. Keep your safe practices, and most importantly, follow your gut instincts. When I was five years old, my stepdad took a job in a town an hour away from the home we were living in. After a few months of a long drive to and from work, my parents decided to start looking for a home closer to his new place of work. Unfortunately, this didn't pan out too well for them. The market at the time made it difficult to find anything, including rentals, at a price they could afford. Around the same time, my stepdad's parents decided to sell their home. This was the house my stepdad grew up in, and in addition to being a well-kept, decent-sized home, there was a lot of sentimental value from my stepdad. When my parents expressed interest in working out a deal with my grandparents to purchase the home, my grandparents simply gave it to them at a price they could afford. And so began the creepiest chapter of my life. I had visited the home many times before, and while I never felt uneasy, There was certainly an energy to the home that I had not felt anywhere else in my short five years. Almost immediately after we moved in, whatever energy was in the house began forming its attachment. Most of the energy in the home seemed to emanate from one room. One of the upstairs bedrooms had a small door in the wall of the closet, leading to an attic. And even as a small child, I was terrified of that room, and that attic in particular. My first bedroom was across the hall from that room. It was one of the few peaceful places in the house that seemed as if no kind of negativity could touch it. Nearly every other space in the house carried with it a feeling of heaviness. The closer we were to the attic or basement, the heavier the air felt and the more our anxiety grew. Around two years after moving into the home, my younger sister was born and once she was old enough to have her own room, she moved into the room I once shared with my brother. I took the downstairs bedroom. I was around six or seven years old and excited to have my own space. I got to choose my own decorations and make it very homey. Prior to moving into the room, it was a dream come true for my childhood self. But the first night I stayed there alone, The heaviness that plagued the majority of the house was more present than I'd ever felt it. I have struggled with anxiety since a very young age, so I simply dismissed it as anxiety, as I would for many of the events that would take place later on. Thankfully, nothing truly scary ever happened in this room, aside from the feeling of heaviness and strange dreams. Eventually, my siblings took over the room with the attic and the closet, At first, they were scared, and being the older sister, I offered to have a sleepover for the first few nights to help make them feel more comfortable. I had become accustomed to the strange energy in the house, and although it was certainly stronger in the room with the attic, I continued to chalk it up to my anxiety disorder. That was the first night that I saw the Shadow Man. The Shadow Man would stand just outside the doorway. He was only visible from this room, and did not appear every night. Still, I continued to believe it was anxiety. A few years later, my siblings and I were older and braver, and decided the attic would make a great clubhouse. We brought toys and decorations in, and set up a cool space near the entrance. But even then, we were terrified of the rear of the attic, where the light didn't reach, and deemed the space off-limits. None of us wanted to admit we were afraid, and each of us claimed it was just too dark to see. But in reality, each of us had seen the Shadow Man lurking. Not just standing still anymore, but moving. Always watching. Darker than the surrounding darkness. Seemingly trying to find a way to get closer to us. 
Over the years, every single one of us would hear our names called from different parts of the house, including my stepdad, who had never had any paranormal experiences in this home growing up, and was an absolute skeptic when it came to anything paranormal. When we would come to where we thought our names were being called from, we would either be greeted with an empty room, or those present were totally confused as to why we thought we were being called. Looking back, one of the creepiest things that sticks with me is the last couple of years in the home, during which my sister and I decided to explore the basement. We had what is called a Michigan basement, which in our case was more or less a pit that had been dug beneath the house with walls of dirt surrounding the space and a three-foot crawl space on top of each wall. Since early childhood, we always had a notion that something interesting was buried within those walls. As kids, we always thought of secret treasure, but as we got older, the running joke became that maybe there was a body buried within the walls. Shortly before moving out, my sister and I decided to explore a bit and crawled around on top of the walls. We found nothing but a few antiques left behind, perhaps by my grandparents or previous owners. The scariest part of the whole story comes years later. My family grew again, and we moved to a newer home on the opposite side of town. We had been there for over two years when the creepy old house came up in conversation. We were watching a show about ghost stories when they started talking about the hat man. I started laughing and said, Man, if we were still in that old house, I would be terrified. I always used to think I saw something like that in the hallway upstairs. I laughed, but my demeanor quickly changed when I saw my mother's and siblings' expressions. We started talking about weird things we experienced in that old house, and as it turns out, every single one of us saw the exact same figure in the hallway, down to every detail. Even worse, he could only be seen from the room that was attached to the attic. While we all routinely heard our names being called in that house and thought nothing of it, not a single one of us has ever experienced that since moving out. My mom even confessed that when she and my stepdad shared the attic room, she awoke very early one morning to a sailor sitting on the edge of the bed who quickly disappeared after her initial fright. She never told anyone about the experience until that day. Later that night, we started digging into the history of the house and discovered that a neighbor whose backyard met with ours was doing some landscaping and discovered the grave of a sailor just steps away from their back door. Needless to say, we were pretty freaked out and didn't talk about it again for some time. Fast forward a few more years. I had gotten married, was expecting my first child, and my husband and I began looking for a home to buy. I hadn't thought much about the old house or its haunts in years. We toured a few homes. We hadn't yet found anything that really fit our needs. This was shortly before the housing market exploded, so there was no sense of urgency or desperation. We were only interested in finding the right space to grow a family. A few months in, I began having a repetitive dream about my old home. In my dream, we purchased the home, and a voice kept telling me to tear out the bathtub. We obliged, and found an old doll hidden in a box in the wall. This doll talked to us, and told us there was something buried in the land. This dream happened multiple times a week, until I began to become obsessed with owning the house. Anytime I was in the area, I would drive by. The more I drove by the house, the more obsessed I became. The home wasn't even for sale, yet I was thinking of ways I could entice the current owners to sell it to us. I needed that house. It freaked me out because I am the opposite of materialistic, and while I had many good memories at that house, I hadn't even thought about it for years. Why was I so obsessed with it? Why was I constantly dreaming about it? 
I immediately began to remind myself of how terrified I was there as a child, and forbade myself from going near it. I stopped thinking about it for a while. My daughter is now four years old. She recently found out that my parents' current home is not the house I spent most of my life in. A few weeks ago, she asked if she could see where I grew up. I hadn't thought about the house for some time, so I agreed. We drove by, and it looked more beautiful and appealing than I remembered despite there being no significant changes to the home. Now, every time we visit my parents, she asks to see it, almost as if it's calling to her, too. I have started having the dreams again. And to this day, if that home went up for sale, I can't promise I wouldn't buy it. This happened when I was about 28. I am almost 40 now. This occurrence comes into my brain from time to time. I try to pass it off like it wasn't a big deal, or nothing substantial happened, but it's rarely been successful. There's a reason I still think about it, over 10 years later. It started when my future wife and I were getting ready to have a nice night out. It was Christmas time. For some reason, I remember that because our town always changed the streetlights on our little subdivisions to red and green. To be clear, it was only the rustic-looking ones that dotted the entrance and exit to the sub. They didn't really provide real streetlights. We had actual taller streetlights that, of course, had to be outfitted with the city-approved LED, or whatever. It was pretty, and a nice touch by the city and our HOA. I was fondly looking at one of the red and green streetlights from our two-bedroom apartment. My fiancé at the time and I had gotten this little place at a great time. Great recession, great prices. Fortunately, we were both working and not doing poorly financially. Since we didn't have children yet, we didn't need much room. This kind of leads into the story. I don't remember the square footage, but it was on the second floor of a three-floor walk-up. It was probably in the range of seven to 800 square feet. Nothing big. We had more than enough room for two of us. That being said, we did not have a great amount of storage to be truthful. We decided to use the smaller second bedroom as a storage room. We enjoyed a very generous master bedroom for both of us and put all of our extra stuff into the second bedroom. As mentioned earlier, we were getting ready to go out. I got home from work first. It was just getting into the evening. In this part of the world, that means it's already dark outside. As I entered the threshold to my home, I hung my coat up, tossed my keys into a dish that was striped black and white, like a referee shirt, and walked toward the kitchen. Being that this place was so small, I passed by both bedrooms as I took a couple steps from the front door to the kitchen. The second bedroom, though, the one we did not use was open. I might not have noticed it, but the light was on. We never kept the light on in that room. Overcome with a sudden feeling of panic, I froze. Shamefully. But thankfully, that didn't last more than a couple of seconds. I cautiously opened the door. Nothing. One nice exhale later, and I shut the light off and closed the door. Either she was putting storage items in the room and forgot to turn the light off, or the last time I was there, I forgot to turn the light off. Simple as that. Anyway, shut the light off, closed the door. Done. We went on to have a great fun night together. After having a few drinks, I brought up the light being left on in the extra bedroom. I think you're busted, I said. She looked at me with a buzzed look of inquiry. When I came home today, the extra bedroom door was open and the light was on. I think I finally confirmed where you keep the presents, I said with a little playfulness in my voice. I haven't been in that room for weeks, she said, with a smile on her face. 
And I keep the presents somewhere you'll never find them. She laughed. I had a brief moment of worry, but quickly put it away from my mind when our next round of shots came from our server. It should have bothered me more now that she confirmed she had not left the door open. As I said, it is possible I went in that room and forgot to close it, but I really doubted that. Several hours later, we stumbled back home, singing, looking at the holiday lights and the decorations on our walk home. Thankfully, our favorite place to get some late-night drinks was only a block away. As she opened the door for us, she threw her keys in the tray, kicked her shoes off and skipped to the living room to throw herself on the couch. I laughed to myself, enjoying the moment and honestly liking where the night was going, until I walked by the extra bedroom. Obviously, she didn't notice. The door was open, maybe two to three inches, and the light was on. Being in an inebriated state, the gravity of this situation did not fully hit me. From what I can remember, I stood by the door for longer than I probably should have. I heard my fiancé call my name from the living room, and it snapped me out of my haze. I quickly reached into the room, slapped the light off, and quietly closed the door. No reason to alert her to some kind of paranormal activity going on. Not tonight. After she went to work the next morning, I sat in the small kitchen trying to decide what was going on. Option 1. Demons. Option 2. There was a very real possibility that someone was in our apartment. Maybe on several occasions... I decided to take a look around the bedroom. The door was still closed from last night, so that's a good sign. The room looked normal. Full of our extra junk, but normal. Until I made my way into the closet. Inside, beside more junk, was a handwritten note. Have fun last night? My fiancé and I reported all of this and stayed with a friend until we could get all of our stuff out. I can't tell you how scary seeing that note was. My uncle Andrew has this story from back when he was a commercial airline pilot. He wasn't piloting the plane this happened to, but he heard the story from a friend who used to fly private jets around West Africa. Apparently, the gig paid well enough, but because of the safety regulations and some of the more turbulent politics around the region, the flying could get pretty hairy from time to time. A bunch of crazy stuff happened to him while he was over, but the thing that made him quit makes for quite the yarn. So apparently, his friend is co-piloting the private jet of some African ambassador. But the plane is basically falling apart. All the dials are faulty. The landing gear was on the fritz. Basically, you were taking your life in your hands whenever you piloted this aircraft. But since they were coming to the end of their contract, they didn't want to quit early and not get their bonus. So they worked with the ground crews to ensure the aircraft was fit for takeoff each time. Point being, my uncle's friend is seriously stressed out, and the actual pilot had taken to drinking most nights just to keep his nerves together. But the straw that broke the camel's back was this one-night flight into Nigeria. The turbulence had been very rough on this occasion, and apparently the pilots are just about ready to throw in the towel. But the flight is almost over, and they are both about to breathe a sigh of relief as they begin their descent into whatever airport they're flying into. The way my uncle tells it, his friend is focusing on the runway, but the entire city is behind it, this massive metropolis of glittering lights. Then suddenly, all the lights just disappear, like the city itself was just swallowed up by the earth. My uncle's friend and the pilot of the private jet just about crap their pants, with their faulty equipment and complete lack of experience landing in that particular city, they are maybe only seconds away from smashing that plane into the runway, or maybe even a building if they tried to pull away too late. 
Then, to make matters worse, the pilot just seemed to shut down. He has this full-on mental breakdown and just freezes up in his seat. My uncle's buddy had to take control of the aircraft and basically just guess where all the runway and the buildings were. He said it was the most stressful and terrifying flight of his life, how he was expecting the plane to just burst into flames any second as it collided with something. He pushed the engine to its absolute limits, too. Said the plane was shaking at the angle he was turning it at. Miraculously, they don't crash or stall, and they make it back into the skies above the darkened city, and my uncle's buddy starts bawling out the pilots for freezing up like he did. But the guy was catatonic until they landed, and didn't say a thing in response. After that, they went into a holding pattern until the power came back on and they could get in touch with air traffic control and get permission to land. I hate flying as it is, but imagining that kind of scenario is like a pucker factor of 10. Word was the pilot was so freaked out that he refused to take the return flight, bought a business class ticket back to the US, and was never seen again. My uncle's friend had to wait until his client could hire a new pilot before he could get out of Lagos or Nairobi, or wherever it was. Somehow, he managed to finish his contract without that plane falling apart on him, or any more cities going dark, and he made it out of Africa with a buttload of bonus cash. But after that, he was much more selective of who his clients were, and I think now he just flies domestic and makes a steady salary that way. Crazy story though, right? Of all the times you don't want to get a power cut, landing a plane is definitely up there. More than a few years ago, I'd say a good 10 years ago, my mother-in-law, we'll call her B for anonymity's sake, but B was living with me and my husband, her son, for a short period due to her ongoing medical issues at the time. We just felt it would be better for her to be with us for a while. Now let me inform you that B was not your typical mother-in-law. She was a serious addict and had been in and out of prison my husband's entire life. But in her older age and health issues, she had been in recovery for eight years strong. When she was using her DOC, she would get so geeked up and she would stay awake for four to five days at a time, non-stop. When she would get like that, she would want to go and rouge old houses or abandoned houses, go through them and taking what she thought was anything of value. Well, one day, I had just walked in my front door to find a note on my kitchen table with what looked like a printout of a Google Earth image search. The note was from B. It stated that she was just playing around on Google Earth, looking around in the area we were currently living, and said she had found an abandoned house deep in the woods fairly close to our house. The house had no mailbox, no driveway, not even the remnants of a driveway, at least not that the printout showed. So I got on Google Earth app myself, located the abandoned house, and nope, no driveway, no mailbox, not even a listed address. And the strangest part was the distance from the main road to the house would have been a good mile hike. There was no dirt road leading to the house, not even a foot trail. I'm not sure what possessed me, but I looked over at B and asked her, you want to go find this house? Needless to say, there was no hesitation on her part, and my genuine curiosity had gotten the best of me. So fast forward a few days, and the following weekend we set out to locate this abandoned house. The road that we had to be on in order to come semi-close to accessing the house was at the end of a residential suburban neighborhood. So we parked the car and started our hike through briars and poison oak and everything in between. It was a rough little hike, but about a good almost mile in, we both look up, and lo and behold, right there in the middle of this dense forest was a clearing, a little less than half a football field with a small simple little house 
with a small stone wall off to the side. I was shocked, to say the least. I looked over at B, and she had the expression of pure excitement all over her face. It didn't take her long to find a way into the house, and to start oohs and ahs. I decided to remain outside. I don't know, something just told me I didn't need to go in that house. So as I'm standing outside this abandoned house in the middle of nowhere, I walk over towards the old stone well, just off the left of the house. I reached the opening to the well, and peered down not being able to see much. I stepped back and sat down on one of the big rocks right next to the well. I then, out of boredom I guess, picked up a big stone and tossed it into the well. Hearing the kerplunk as the stone tumbled down and hit the water at the bottom. So I stand up and I lean toward the well. With the most horrific, rotting, putrid smell hits me like a ton of bricks. The smell was so bad it felt like it burned the inside of my nose. And let me tell you, it's that smell that once you've smelled it, you will never forget it. I dug my little flashlight out of my pocket and pointed it down the dark well. When I was able to focus on what I was actually looking at, I fell backwards as if I was pushed by an unseen force, falling flat on my butt. I'll never forget what I saw at the bottom of that well. Two elbows and the back of a head with long hair. That smell was the smell of a decaying human body. I don't think I've ever ran that fast in my life. I just took off, not even telling B I was leaving. I just started running and didn't stop until I reached the car. I sat in my car for about an hour just trying to process what I had just found and waited on B to figure out that I had already left. She finally made it back to the car with all the valuables she had found in hand. When she finally got in the passenger seat, I was as white as a ghost and was in shock. She asked me what was wrong and I told her exactly what I found. Her jaw hit the floor and she too turned as white as I was. I wasn't sure what to do to be honest, so I simply drove to the closest store and called the non-emergency 911 line and explained what I had just found and how I stumbled onto it. Needless to say, the investigator thought me and B were basically full of crap, but he got in his car and followed us to the end of the neighborhood and explained that he would have to hike a good mile to find the abandoned house and the well where the body was. No more than 20 minutes later, we see police cars and the coroner van pull up at the end of the neighborhood. Eventually, they started to tape off the entire wooded area. As I'm just sitting in my car, asking one of the many officers there if B and I could leave. I look past the officer to see two people carrying out a black, completely zipped up body bag and placing it into the back of the coroner's van. I shuddered at the thought of who that person was or what could have happened to them. A few months later, I get a phone call from one of the detectives working on the body in the well case. She wanted to inform me that they were able to identify who the person in the well was. She was a 24-year-old female who had been reported missing out of a small town called Between, Georgia, seven to eight months ago. Between, Georgia was only an hour and a half drive without traffic from where her body was found. The craziest part is the multiple detectives on this case live and grew up in the area where the body was found, their entire lives, most of them being in their mid to late fifties, and not one of them have ever known about or heard about the abandoned house in the middle of the woods. On the 3rd of May, 2007, Three-year-old Madeline McCann disappeared from her bed in a vacation apartment at a resort in the Algarve region of Portugal, more commonly known as Maddie in the media, and to those close to her, she had been taken on vacation by her parents, Kate and Gary, along with her younger twin siblings. 
One night, the McCanns left their children to sleep in the ground floor apartments they were staying in, while they ate at a nearby restaurant. Kate and Gary had assumed it would be safe to leave their children alone for the duration, since the aforementioned restaurant was just 180 feet away, which would allow them to momentarily check on them from time to time. But when Kate went to check up on the children at around 10 p.m., she discovered that Maddie was missing. Over the next few weeks, Portuguese police managed to misinterpret some of the DNA evidence collected from the crime scene. This led to them suspecting that Maddie had died in some kind of tragic accident at the apartment, with their parents covering up their own involvement by faking a kidnapping. The McCanns were formally declared suspects in the case by Portuguese police in September 2007, but were essentially absolved of any suspicion in July of 2008, when Portugal's Attorney General archived the case on the grounds that there was too little evidence to take a case against them to trial. Britain's own Scotland Yard law enforcement agency then began its own investigation, Operation Grange, in mid-2011. After a fair amount of research, the senior investigating officer declared that he was treating the disappearance as a criminal act by a stranger, most likely a planned abduction or burglary that had turned violent when the perpetrators believed themselves discovered. In 2013, Scotland Yard released composite images of local men they wanted to talk to regarding Maddie's disappearance, including one man seen carrying a child toward the beach the same night she disappeared. Shortly after this, in light of new local suspects being identified, the Portuguese police reopened their inquiry into her disappearance. This caused Britain's Operation Grange to be scaled back in 2015 to allow Portuguese authorities more control over the investigation. But some of the detectives who worked on the case continued to pursue a small number of inquiries that they seemed worthy of following up. A prominent British newspaper described the disappearance as the most heavily reported missing person case in modern history. And to this day, her whereabouts remain a complete mystery. Despite the fact that police in multiple countries were involved in trying to locate their daughter, the McCanns took it upon themselves to hire a company of private investigators to dig up information that might help regular police agencies in their search. The PI company, known as Oakley International, was based in Washington, D.C. in the United States and was initially awarded a six-month contract worth then half a million dollars that was raised mostly by charitable donations made by members of the public. Oakley International began to interview potential witnesses, delve through security footage, and trace clues all over Europe. But in 2008, the McCanns leveled a serious accusation at the firm's 56-year-old Irish CEO, Kevin Halligen, which meant they reneged on the contract, handing over only half of what the firm was apparently owed. Halogen was said to be misusing resources meant solely for the purpose of finding Maddie, allegedly using them to fund a lavish lifestyle of travel and leisure. Halogen fiercely denied the claims, but it appears the man was no stranger to fraud. In 2012, he was extradited to the U.S. to face charges over an unrelated $1.3 million fraud, to which he pleaded guilty the following year. He was sentenced to 41 months in prison, but was deported from the United States soon after his court appearance because of the time he had already spent behind bars. Halogen had escaped the possibility of a lengthy jail term in the U.S., probably because he was wealthy enough to afford the best defense attorneys that money could buy. But because he had become central to the floundering and now apparently corrupt efforts to locate young Maddie, he had angered a lot of people along the way and made himself many enemies, some of which vowed to seek revenge on a man that apparently used a little girl's abduction for his own financial gain, which is why it is so suspicious that he died suddenly at his home in Guildford, Surrey, in January of 2018. Adrian Gatton, a TV director and investigative journalist, 
who made a documentary with Halogen in 2014, confirmed his death to the Press Association, saying that he had not been in good health. There was blood around the house, probably caused by previous falls when he was either drunk or blacking out, he said. His house was full of empty drink bottles. A lot of people wished him ill, but his death is almost certainly related to alcoholism. But following his death, a Surrey police spokesman said that we were called to an address in Cobbett Hill Road, Normandy, following a report of a man in his 50s having been taken unwell, who subsequently died. The death is being treated as unexplained, and a file will be passed to the coroner's office in due course. Unexplained. Certainly not a word we might expect to hear following the death of a man who, as Adrian Gatton had phrased it, was certainly related to alcoholism. The fact remains that when the police broke into Halogen's home, they found blood stains all over the house. There is of course the possibility that Halogen's corruptly wicked ways had finally caught up with him, that the people who were furious and vengeful regarding Maddie's disappearance heard of his apparent corruption, and then channeled their anger toward him. But Halogen always insisted that the media reports were a gross distortion of what actually happened. The print media in particular took this line that really nothing was being done. I was living the high life on the proceeds of the McCann case, he once said. Trust me, I didn't so much as buy a new suit. The money, all of it, is fully accountable. It's provable. It seems that Halogen was very keen on proving his innocence with regards to the Find Maddie fund that he was accused of misusing. Perhaps the alcoholism he was said to suffer from was a direct result of the ire he had occurred was a manifestation of the pain that any innocent man would suffer under that kind of undue scrutiny. And maybe, just maybe, he believed that finding Maddie would vindicate him. Did Halogen die a natural death? Did he even die an explainable one due to his heavy drinking? No. Unexplained. That's how Surrey police described his death. There's every possibility that he was murdered, and if indeed he was, could it possibly be because he had gotten so close to the truth behind Maddie's disappearance that someone, somewhere, felt that he must be silenced? The actual disappearance took place in Portugal. Halogen's death occurred in Surrey, England. And in June of 2020, a public prosecutor in Germany ordered an inquiry regarding a possible involvement of a 43-year-old man believed to have been living in a borrowed VW camper van in the Algarve at the time of McCann's disappearance. The suspect's car, an expensive Jaguar XJR6, was registered to a new owner the day after McCann disappeared. These international connections suggest a coordinated network of child kidnappers, complete with a system of support and logistics that could prove deadly under the right circumstances. Yet regardless, it seems the case that we will never truly know how and why Madeline McCann was abducted, where she is now, or if she is alive or dead. But if we ever do uncover the truth, we might just lift the lid on a terrifyingly well-organized conspiracy that has been responsible for the disappearances of children all over Europe, time and time again. And frankly, I'm not sure the general public is ready for that kind of information, nor are they ready to find out just how far the tendrils of such an organization really run. This is my boyfriend's story, which he gave permission to share. It's about a very, very eerie encounter that nobody can really understand fully to this day. My boyfriend is an absolute skeptic, but he definitely does not claim to know what exactly happened either. For context, my boyfriend and I are from South Brazil. He was around 24 or 25 years old when this happened. He used to live in a big city and went out running almost every day. 
It was pretty much the same route, and he used to go through an old cemetery near his home. The neighborhood around his house and the cemetery was pretty dangerous, especially at night. He used to live in a very old building, kind of like the project for working class people who worked in factories built in the 50s. It's actually a Brazilian historical landmark and holds years of history. So on this day, he went running and entered the cemetery. It was a hot summer evening around 5 p.m. The place would always close at 6. He was running by the back of the graveyard on a path surrounded by trees and headstones. There was a high hill between him and the entrance, which was high enough that he couldn't spot the entrance door or fence from where he was standing. Everything was fine and peaceful until he got to this spot, on the far end of the cemetery. He says he remembers hearing footsteps over his music, but never seeing anyone behind or in front of him. That was until the sudden moment that a voice called for him loud enough for him to stop and take his earphones off. He looks around, but sees nothing. Keeps running, going a bit slower. Then, as soon as he looks up the hill on his side, he sees a man there, staring and walking towards him. He was a very old man, probably late 70s, looking extremely thin and pale. My boyfriend recalls very clearly that the old man was wearing a ragged old-style mustard yellow shirt and khaki pants. The man was holding his ID in one hand, and a very decrepit suitcase in another. My boyfriend stopped moving and noticed that the man had an insane amount of sand and dirt on him, even though there wasn't any sand around. The man, still up on the hill, got very close to my boyfriend and kept repeating the same thing, over and over again. Hello, my name is Cicero and I'm trapped in here. My name is Cicero and I'm trapped. I can't leave. I'm trapped. My boyfriend says that in the moment, he didn't feel threatened or scared, just a bit confused with the man's appearance and strange behavior. Cicero kept holding his ID in front of him, but the piece of paper was so dirty that my boyfriend couldn't read anything. When he finally understood what Cicero was saying, my boyfriend started pointing out the exit, which was straight over the hill to the opposite side or through the side part he was running on. The whole time he was saying this, Cicero kept looking at him intently, kind of half listening, still holding his ID card in front of him. Once my boyfriend stopped talking, Cicero began saying he was trapped here and that he couldn't leave this place. My boyfriend was getting annoyed and he simply thought at the time that this was a very confused old man and repeated the same explanation. He then resumed walking down the path again. Cicero kept repeating his words, but he then asked something else. His voice got very desperate at this point. He said, Please help me. I want to leave, but I'm trapped. I don't know how. Please help me. It was then that my boyfriend started getting a little spooked. He glanced over again and Cicero was still standing on the hill above him. My boyfriend says that there was so much sand on the man that some was spilling on the ground near him. Cicero had big, scared eyes, like he had seen so much and actually needed help. My boyfriend then stopped walking. There was absolutely no one around, and it was getting darker. He decided to speak to Cicero from a distance. Very calmly, my boyfriend explained over and over again how to access the exit, and suggested that maybe Cicero could also try going through a metal fence that had lots of holes in it, if he so preferred. After a moment of silence, Cicero lowered his ID. My boyfriend thought that he would get angry or violent, but Cicero just smiled and said very peacefully, Okay, thank you very much. Then Cicero turned around and left, walking the opposite side and disappearing down the hill. My boyfriend was scared by this point because he was thinking about his eerie surroundings, the strangeness of the man's demeanor, and also the fast-approaching darkness. 
He remembers thinking that the weirdest thing about it, apart from all the sand and tattered clothes, was that it was incredibly easy to leave the cemetery. It wasn't a big or confusing place, and it had only one huge metal entrance. So my boyfriend ran pretty fast and left, right before a guy closed up the doors with a padlock. He looked around to see if Cicero got out, but didn't see anyone. He then says that he got home and told his mom, who's a very religious woman. She was absolutely certain that Cicero was a spirit trapped in the place, and the body was buried. Her theory is that the man had been there for years, since his clothes were old style, and the place that they lived in had had a lot of violent deaths over the years. My boyfriend also recalls feeling incredibly creeped out over the next few weeks. He experienced sudden urges or sadness and despair out of nowhere, especially at night. He used to sleep with his windows open because of the heat, but started closing them after he heard, more than once, some hushed male voices outside in the middle of the night. He never went back to that cemetery alone and took a long time to return. Nobody else he told this story to knew about Cicero or ever saw someone resembling him. Now, of course, we know this encounter could be explained as a confused person who needed help. But the way Cicero asked for help, and the way his old clothes looked like they were fresh from the grave, haunts my boyfriend to this day. I just hope Cicero found his way in the end. Martha Jean Lambert was born on March 26th of 1973 to Howard and Margaret Lambert in St. Augustine Beach, Florida. Martha Jean was an extremely popular young lady among her peers and greatly enjoyed spending quality time with her many friends and family members. Those that knew her often described her as kind and shy, saying that she had a generally happy demeanor. But despite this, her home life was not great. Her father Howard was an abusive, raging alcoholic with a fierce and volatile temper, and her mother Margaret could often be heard arguing with him when he came home drunk from various bars around St. Augustine. As a result of this highly unstable and distressing relationship between her parents, Martha and her two older brothers were often cared for in various foster homes, which had a highly negative impact on their academic performance. Yet in spite of such difficulties, Martha was known for being something of a tough cookie, and she didn't let it get her down too much, maintaining a positive attitude wherever she was. In 1985, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving was a day much like any other for young Martha. She spent the day attending her usual classes at school, and then when it was over, she went over to a friend's house to hang out until around 7.30 that evening when she began the short walk back to her parents' trailer. Only that much is certain about what happened that evening. Afterwards, things began to get very unclear indeed, and mainly due to conflicting accounts given by her very own family members. What we do know for definitely is that it wasn't until 3 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day that Martha was actually reported missing. Her family told the police that she was a 12-year-old white girl with sandy blonde hair and bright blue eyes, standing at roughly 4 feet and 5 inches tall and weighing just shy of 70 pounds. She was also described as having birthmarks on both her upper left chest as well as on the front of her right thigh. Last her parents had seen of her, she had been wearing a short-sleeved summer dress. Given her age and inherent vulnerability, the cops started an intense search for Martha as soon as the missing persons report came in. They initially focused their search around the area near the State Road 207, a stretch of four-lane highway that ran through northeastern Florida. They also scoured areas around Cary Lynn Road, the place that Martha and her family called home. Yet despite their efforts, not a single trace of Martha Jean could be found, and to the heartbreaking disappointment of her family, the trail soon ran cold. 
Strangely enough, from the very moment she realized her daughter was missing, Martha's mother insisted that her daughter had been kidnapped. This is a rather curious detail, as it's a rather specific idea of her daughter's fate. Not that she had been murdered, gotten lost, or ran away from what was undoubtedly a broken home. Specifically kidnapped. Martha's mother told police that on the night in question, that she wasn't at her friend's house until the mid-evening, and she was in fact attending a social gathering with her. She had apparently turned to her mother, and in reference to visiting the friend's house, said, I'm going over to a friend's. I'll be back in five minutes. But Martha never returned, and by the time her mother had realized something was amiss, it was far too late. She searched and she searched, all night and into the wee small hours of the following morning. And by the time 3 a.m. rolled around, Martha's mother was worried half to death. Police questioned pretty much everyone in the surrounding area and found that some of Martha's neighbors had some very interesting information regarding some suspicious activity in the neighborhood. Shortly after Martha was seen walking west down Cary Lynn Road that evening, a few members of the local community had seen a suspicious green van in the area, one that was seen to drive in roughly the same direction as Martha a short while after she had left the social gathering. And what was most concerning was that not a single person who had seen it was able to recognize the van as belonging to anyone in the community, and nor had they been able to record a license plate number. Conflicting with his mother's account, Martha's brother David told the police that he and his sister were having dinner together that night, during the time just before she disappeared. He mentioned that she had gotten up from the table and walked out of the house, refusing to tell him where she was going before she climbed into the passenger seat of a black sedan. Yet police were forced to dismiss Martha's brother's claims in the face of other more consistent accounts, yet were continuously flummoxed as to why the boy had given them such a strange, fabricated version of events. Despite her mother's insistence that she had been kidnapped, police originally assumed that Martha was a runaway due to the violent and volatile situation between her parents. But it only took a small amount of speculation and investigation for them to conclude that there was most likely some degree of foul play involved in her disappearance that had most likely ended in her murder. However, not a single suspect has been named as her kidnapper, and there have never been any arrests regarding her disappearance. Essentially, Martha walked off that night from somewhere and basically vanished from the face of the earth. A few days after she had initially disappeared, a handful of police officers scoured a wooded area behind the family's trailer for any sign of her, but again, nothing was found. Detectives also put a substantial amount of man-hours into searching for Martha's remains around the area where the Florida Memorial College once stood. But again, nothing was found. It confounded them. All the places where it was thought that she may have either run off to or have been dumped were completely devoid of clues. As a result, it was assumed that Martha's mother had been correct in her assertions and that Martha had indeed been kidnapped by someone who wasn't part of her extended family. Many missing persons agencies in the United States still classify Martha's case as a non-family abduction to this day. Yet despite this, police say there is absolutely nothing to back this up, that there is no evidence of abduction and the green van theory, the one that neighbors claim they saw, has never been substantiated. The one real discrepancy with the whole case is the fact that Martha's older brother David seems to have lied about what happened that night. As a result, for a while he actually became the closest thing the investigation ever had to a serious suspect, based on the fact that there were obvious lies being told, and that his story seemed to change in its details on a few different occasions. As was previously mentioned, David claims that he saw Martha get into a black sedan that evening after they had dinner together, but he later changed his story to say that she had simply left to visit a local convenience store and then never returned home. 
Due to these inconsistencies, investigators suspected that, although David might not have murdered her, there was definitely some information that he knew that he was not entirely forthcoming with. After all, he was only 14 years old at the time of the disappearance, and may not have been capable of cold-blooded murder. However, in the year 2000, when David was 29 years old, he approached local law enforcement with an outrageously shocking claim. He confessed to killing his sister, and told officers that he had disposed of her body in a mine located on Holmes Boulevard. Yet when the police searched the mine, there were no human remains to be found, nor any signs that anyone had been hurt or murdered there at all which meant that despite his apparently full and frank confession, there was simply not enough evidence to charge David with his sister's murder. But then again, in 2009, David tried to convince the cops that it was in fact him that had murdered his sister, but changed his story from the version he had given nine years previously. This time around, David claimed that he and Martha had been playing together on the grounds of the then derelict Florida Memorial College building, having left their parents' trailer after a drunken argument had broken out over an overcooked Thanksgiving turkey. David said once that they were tired of playing, that they walked to a nearby convenience store to purchase refreshments. It was at this store that they began to argue over a $20 bill that David had nabbed from his mother's purse. When the argument peaked, Martha slapped David across the face. David told the police that he had retaliated by shoving her, which caused her to fall backwards in an awkward fashion, smashing her head on a piece of metal as she fell. David panicked, called for help, but after seeing that no one was around, dragged his sister's body back to the grounds of the old college before burying her in a shallow grave. Once again, such a detailed confession warranted investigation, but just like the previous occasion, there was absolutely no evidence found to support it. But since the college buildings were demolished in the mid-90s and the grounds excavated, there is every chance that her body could have been lost among the debris as it was being disposed of. However, when Martha's mother was asked if she believed that David had murdered her, she completely rebuked the idea. Even in the face of such an apparently frank confession, David's mother insisted that David often told lies in order to get attention and doubled down on her claims that some kind of outsider was responsible for Martha's disappearance. Whether or not it was a result of direct pressure from his mother, David ended up retracting these previous confessions admitting that he had completely fabricated the stories so that law enforcement would give up the search for Martha and declare the case closed. He went on to admit that he suffered from intense emotional and mental problems, and it was these that made him outright lie about his involvement in his sister's disappearance, now denying that he had anything to do with it. As of November 2020, almost 25 years to the day since she disappeared, Martha Jean Lambert's disappearance remains completely unsolved, and no human remains have ever been discovered. There are only really two main theories regarding her disappearance, which revolve around the idea of abduction or her brother accidentally killing her. But as previously stated, there is very little evidence to support either theory, and so logically, neither can be fully supported since there have been no arrests or charges. But that doesn't stop many from insisting that since David's confession is so detailed and believable, that we cannot simply dismiss his stories, even though they seemed to shift in their details over time. Essentially, the one person whose story deviated may have just allowed a drip of information over time, unable to quite face the truth himself. Then, overcome with guilt 15 years after the murder, he came forward to give a full and frank account of what happened that night. After he did so, David's mother, not wanting to lose two children to the same incident, may well have convinced him to retract his confession so that he wouldn't end up rotting in prison. On top of that, the statute of limitations for manslaughter had expired by the time he made his first confession, which raises the question, 
Is that simply a coincidence? Or was it a well-timed attempt to both clear his conscience while avoiding any actual punishment for his actions? Either way, it is pure speculation, and the case may truly be that we will never, ever know what really happened to Martha Jean Lambert that Thanksgiving night. And it is a truly terrifying thought that a young girl can simply vanish from the face of the earth with no closure to her friends, family, or society as a whole. Back in 2018, I had just graduated and found a job in another city, and after searching for a long time, I finally moved into a shared house with four other roommates. The house was in the city center area, ten minutes away from my work, but it was very old and creaky. It was impossible to walk from one room to another without waking up the whole house, and I found it really hard to get used to the noises. But what made my life easier is that I got along really well with all of my roommates, as I knew a few of them from high school. We hung out together to play games and watch TV, or just have dinner and talk about random things. A few months later around Christmas time, all of my roommates were going back home to spend the holidays with their families. But I had to stay for a couple of days as I was new at work and too shy to ask my coworkers to swap shifts with me so I can spend some time with my family. One day before Christmas, my roommate Emily was the last one to leave that morning. It was a really busy day. Everyone was rushing to do last minute shopping. It all seemed magical and peaceful and full of life. I finished my shift around four in the morning and headed home. As I was walking, I felt a whole different vibe in the air. The streets were empty and calm in an eerie way. I have always finished around this time, but it was never this empty in this area. Suddenly I had this feeling in my stomach, the kind of feeling you have when you know something bad is about to happen, and you regret every decision you made that led to this place and this moment in time. I kept checking behind my back to see if there was anyone around. I pretended to talk on the phone at some point just to try and calm myself down as if this would stop anything from happening. As I'm holding my phone and still pretending to talk to someone, I hear footsteps. I stopped talking just to hear a bit clearer, hoping that I was just imagining this, but I could still hear the footsteps behind me, getting closer and closer. I suddenly realized that I haven't said anything in a while, and continued to talk and try to make it sound as if someone is waiting for me. I was only a minute or two away from my house, but I decided to cross the road just so I could check behind me without looking suspicious. So I started crossing and scanning the area around me. I didn't see anyone. I couldn't hear the footsteps either. I started doubting myself. I held my keys tight in my fist. One, to use them as a weapon if needed, and two, to open the door as fast as possible which is exactly what I did. I checked to make sure no one is around, and I crossed the road, running to my house, where I opened the door and locked it behind me. I wish the story ended here, but it doesn't. Before I even had a chance to catch my breath, I walked around the house and turned on the lights. I also turned on the TV, thinking whoever is out there would think there are more people in here, and would leave me alone. I grabbed a knife and went upstairs to look from my bedroom window for a better view to the street, trying to see if anyone is around. I kept looking in all directions for an hour, but didn't see anyone or anything unusual. I felt silly for doing all this for nothing, thinking it must have been a lost cat or something. Then I went downstairs to eat, before I headed off to sleep. I finished the meal and decided to take out the trash which is right in front of the door. It would only take a few seconds, and nothing can happen in this very short period of time. Right? I grabbed the trash and looked around from the small window next to the door. I couldn't see anything, 
so I decided to go ahead and open the door. I threw the bag in the bin and went back in, but as I was closing the door, a man sprinted across the street towards me. I don't know how I managed to close the door and lock it, but I did. The man started pounding on the door and shouting, Let me in! Let me in! I was terrified. I felt I couldn't move, just standing there looking at the door. Then I pulled myself together and ran to the kitchen to grab the knife again and call 911. After waiting behind the kitchen door, shaking and crying in despair, the police finally arrived and arrested the man. They said he had a pocket knife and a screwdriver hidden in his jacket. Apparently, it was not his first time to break into someone's house and attacking the residents. I try not to think of what could have happened that day if I had moved just a little bit slower. On a rainy Valentine's Day evening in February of 1971, 19-year-old Jesse McBain drove over to meet his girlfriend, Patricia Mann, at her college dormitory in Durham, North Carolina. They had arranged to celebrate the most romantic day of the year by attending a Valentine's dance at the nearby Watts Hospital. Patricia was studying nursing, and her practical lessons took place at Watts, so as a potential future member of the nursing staff there, she had managed to land an invitation to the dance. At approximately 11.30 p.m., Jesse and Patricia had one last dance, said their goodbyes, then began to walk back to Jesse's car. They then drove over to a deserted housing development area that would later become the neighborhood of Crowsdale. No house had been constructed yet, but a few sections of road had been laid out in an area that was shrouded by a quarter mile's worth of greenery. Those that ventured down there were likely to find collections of beer bottles and cigarette butts strewn among the trees. It was a place people went to screw around, exactly the kind of private, out-of-the-way place that two young lovebirds might need to get a little alone time. Patricia's 1 a.m. curfew came and went, and her friends back in the girls' dorm assumed she would sneak back in at some point on her tiptoes. Yet little did they know they would never see her or her boyfriend ever again. The following morning, Patricia still hadn't returned from her date with Jesse. This was the first time the young woman had ever broken her dormitory curfew, and those close to her were quickly beginning to worry. They knew Patricia to be a deeply mature and responsible young woman, who always played by the rules and took authority seriously. And to their knowledge, Jesse was an affectionate, respectful boyfriend, one that Patricia seemed very much in love with. But not even youthful romance would be able to make the young nursing student break curfew. Slowly but surely, as the day progressed, the concern of Patricia's roommates went from mild to grave. What started with a few questions turned to them calling around local hospitals in case they had been in a car accident. They then filed a missing persons report with the Durham County Sheriff's Department but were still so anxious that they began to physically search for their missing roommate on foot. They roamed the surrounding area, canvassing her usual hangout spots around town and on campus, until someone had the idea to go search the Lover's Lane over at the housing development. It was here that the searchers would find Jesse's empty car parked in one of the quieter spots on the development. The car was locked, and on the back seats were two warm coats, presumably belonging to Jesse and Patricia. There was no damage to the car. Everything about the scene seemed perfectly in order, except, of course, for the fact that the last two people to travel in it seemed to have vanished from the face of the earth. By this point, local police have informed both Jesse and Patricia's parents that their children are missing. At first, all involved had entertained the idea that the couple's disappearance was nothing more than a misguided, but romantic attempt to elope, to skip town, get hitched, and settle down somewhere new. But investigating police quickly began to realize that there was something distinctly sinister about the case. There had apparently been no attempt by either Jesse or Patricia to inform anyone of their plans, not even close friends, 
and the idea that neither would at least leave a note or letter to a relative seemed highly unlikely. Over time, those closest to Patricia began to assume the worst. I just got the sickest feeling in my stomach, said a cousin of Patricia's. I just knew something terrible had happened. For two weeks after they were declared missing, a team of police officers and local volunteers mounted an intensive search of the surrounding area, combing through the wooded areas around Lover's Lane for any trace of the missing couple. They followed up lead after lead and tip after tip, but no one could find hide nor hair of Jesse or Patricia. With frustration mounting, police decided to widen the range of the search area and enlist the help of helicopter support and specially trained forensic divers. But in the end, it was the misfortune of a surveyor in nearby Orange County that provided the police with their most important lead. On February 25, 1971, a full 12 days after Jesse and Patricia went missing, Robert Kirby is walking along a dirt road in the backwoods of Orange County, North Carolina, when something catches his eye. Among the trees, maybe 50 meters or so off the trail, the surveyor thinks he sees what appears to be the limb of a mannequin laying among the fallen leaves. Curious, he wanders over to check it out, but the distinct shape of a human leg he sees is not that of a plastic mannequin. It is real human flesh. He rushes to a nearby roadside diner to have someone call the police, and by the end of that, forensic investigators discovered not one, but two human corpses up in the woods of Orange County, and they turned out to belong to none other than Jesse McBain and Patricia Mann. Finding the young couple and that they were decomposing was bad enough for the searchers, but the manner in which they had obviously been dispatched was massively disturbing to them. The couple had their hands tied, and they were made to stand back against a tree so another, larger rope could be wrapped around them. Once their killer had secured them in place, he began to torture them. Jesse's ear and mouth were both found to have blood in them, and a variety of large and small abrasions to his lips and forehead suggested he was beaten senseless before he was killed. At some point, Jesse and Patricia's killer had ripped their eyelashes off before continuing to savagely beat them. Then, when whoever had tied them up had grown tired of beating them, they wrapped rope collars around their necks, using a kind of knot that could be repeatedly tightened over and over again. We can only assume that the killer used these rope collars to slowly choke the life out of Jesse and Patricia, gradually tightening the rope collars over a drawn-out period of time until neither was able to breathe. Each of the couple's bodies had all of their valuables intact. Jesse was still wearing an expensive wristwatch and a class ring when his body was found. Patricia was also wearing jewelry, and her purse was left back in the abandoned car. Their deaths were not part of some robbery. Their killer had absolutely no monetary gain in mind when he had taken them. Neither were there any signs of indecent assault on Patricia. She had a great deal of bruising around her face and neck, but nothing below the waistline. There was no ulterior motive. All their killer wanted to do was torture and kill them. The investigation that followed was severely hampered by different agencies' complete lack of collaboration. For example, the FBI seemed to consider the local sheriffs as frankly beneath them and a feeling of contempt quickly grew between the two groups. Everyone worked on the case as individuals, as Detective Tom Horn once put it. Not a lot of information was being shared by the various agencies, and the rivalry was tremendous. A lot of work was done, but it was individual, so there was definitely some missed opportunities. Yet even with the appalling level of disorganization that pervaded, a number of likely suspects emerged as a result of some tip-top police work. Some had to be ruled out after taking polygraph tests, which proved their innocence. But one of the men who failed was actually a doctor at Watts Hospital, who had previously worked with Patricia Mann. When the police sought to question him again, he completely refused to cooperate. 
and would only release a statement through a defense attorney he began to keep on retainer. This made him the number one suspect in the entire case, and to this day, there's never really been anyone else who had garnered such legitimate scrutiny. But without the proper evidence to charge him, very little action was taken against any of the supposed killers. No one ever really zeroed in on anyone, Detective Horn stated, and as a result, the case quickly went cold. 43 years later in 2014, Detective Tim Horn was still working for the Orange County Sheriff's Department when a cousin of Patricia's, Carolyn Spivey, contacted him with some fresh information regarding her cousin's murder. Along with his partner at the time, Detective Horn opened up the previously closed case file, poring over old statements and boxes of evidence. They reanalyzed the possibilities of former suspects, considered new ones, and began to condense as much of the multi-agency information as possible into the pursuit of one solid suspect, and they succeeded. Detective Horn then contacted almost every single one of the detectives who worked the case back in 1971 and gathered them together for a presentation. It was one which would show them how he had pieced together multiple pieces of a decades-long puzzle, only to come to one solid conclusion, that it was the Watts doctor, a man Patricia had actually known, that had murdered her and her boyfriend Jesse. When the presentation was finished, what followed was a prolonged silence. To all in attendance, Tim Horn's hard work had presented them the best opportunity yet to end a mystery that had persisted for almost half a century. They had their suspect. They had evidence. Now it was time to make their move. Using what's known as an MVAC, Detective Horn was able to extract a DNA sample from the knotted ropes used to tie up and strangle Jesse and Patricia. An MVAC is basically a wet vacuum DNA collection system that is designed to extract strands of DNA from difficult to reach places. Places just like the fibrous folds in a length of rope. What came back was a DNA sample that didn't match either Jesse or Patricia, so in all likelihood, it belonged to the killer. Detective Horn then requested a DNA sample from their number one suspect, the watch doctor that Patricia had worked with. Horn's argument was that, after all this time, the doctor would finally be able to clear his name and prove that it wasn't him that executed the young couple. But the doctor refused having his defense attorney contact law enforcement to release a statement in legalis. And that just might be the most suspicious thing about our doctor, because it really does raise the question of what does he have to hide. Yet despite such obvious suspicion, this doctor has never been charged, and whatever new evidence led to him being asked to provide a DNA sample hasn't been shared with the public. We can only assume that the Durham County Sheriff's Department are in the process of putting a serious case against the man, and are trying to find some way of forcing him to give a sample of his DNA. And with that DNA sample, law enforcement might just be able to end the 40-year-old mystery of who could be cold and cruel enough to wrench a loved-up young couple away from one of the happiest nights of their lives, only to torture and eventually execute them in a secluded, wooded area, turning a romantic Valentine's Day night into the very last that each of them would ever spend on Earth. For context, I grew up in a small South Brazilian town it's a very nice but very cold place up in the mountains. I have had an amazing childhood and still remember most of it fondly, being now a 27-year-old woman. However, something happened to me and my friends one night that will forever haunt me. When I was in high school, the teachers used to organize an annual gymkhana. It's a very common thing over here, a three or four day event full of competitive tasks, riddles, puzzles, and scavenging with teams competing for the final award. It used to involve the whole school and pretty much the whole town. 
So, in one of those events, there was one particular task called something like, look for your teacher, where one teacher would hide somewhere in the town, and we, as teams, had to decipher the riddles and go look for them. This was the absolute favorite activity between me and my friends. Looking back, I don't really know how the teachers thought that having a bunch of kids out in the night would be a good idea. But our town was and still is pretty safe, with an incredibly low crime rate. So, when I was about 12 or 13, I was right in the middle of a gymkhana, when something terrifying happened. It was a freezing cold night, and my team had solved the look for your teacher riddle. Me and my best friend Junior and a few other kids hopped into some older kid's car and followed the clue until we reached a very dark residential neighborhood surrounded by woods. It was in the suburbs, so the streets were dead quiet and the only light came from the overhead poles. It was probably around 10 or 11 p.m. and our small squad was very excited to be out in the night this late. We found some other kids from another team, so we figured we were in the right place. Junior and I got our flashlights and anxiously started to look for our science teacher. Since we are best friends since preschool, our feelings and interests are very much in sync. I've always felt safer with him by my side. We were walking and discussing where we thought the teacher would be hidden, maybe behind a tree, or up in one, or perhaps even buried in some leaves. So, we decide to head into the woods. It was very dark, but there were so many kids with flashlights that it didn't feel creepy at first. I was feeling that bubbly, childish enthusiasm kids feel when they are having a lot of fun. We were a few minutes into the search when I suddenly flashed my light to the side and illuminated a man standing by a tree looking at us. I didn't recognize the man, but I also didn't pay much attention since it could have been a parent or someone from another team. So Junior and I kept walking and laughing when suddenly I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turned around and saw the man again. I remember that he was tall, middle-aged, bald, and had big green or blue eyes. He didn't seem familiar. And now I suddenly felt my stomach tighten a little by the sudden contact with a stranger. The man smiled and asked us if we knew where the teacher was. He spoke to us, but only looked at me, trying to seem amicable. Being a shy and careful kid, I didn't feel good about this at all, so I said no and turned around. Junior and I kept walking fast, both pretty apprehensive. Junior never really liked physical contact very much, but he actually grabbed my hand and helped me go through the dark trees further away from the man. I remember we kind of tried to run from him, getting closer to other kids and adults. We turned around many times, but thankfully, didn't see him again. The search went on, and we kind of forgot about this guy. We had a blast, and someone from another team found our science teacher hidden in a tree, literally sitting on a high branch. It was all pretty fun, until we emerged from the woods and started making our way to the cars. It was then that we heard some commotion behind us. We didn't really understand what was being said, but some older kids and teachers were discussing something, and their faces were pretty serious. Junior and I went closer to the adults and understood that a little girl from another team was missing. There were some people still in the woods, but they were supposed to be coming back since the activity was over. This was before everyone had cell phones, so I'm pretty sure most kids didn't have a way of communicating like we do now. Even so, we all heard our teachers speaking loudly that the search was over. After some adults went looking for the girl, we got a little bit more info, and I actually realized that I knew her. She was a tiny, blonde little thing, probably around seven years old. I don't remember her name, though. Before we could do anything to help, the adults and older kids told us to quickly go back to the team's building. We went back, then home. The gymkhana went on normally, like nothing ever happened. I guess my team made it to second place. I kind of thought it was all very weird about the girl, 
but didn't really connect the dots until a few days later. Back in school, our class was talking about the missing girl, who was actually found hours later that same night. As it turns out, she was briefly kidnapped by that older man that we saw in the woods. Somehow, the guy had lured her away from the group and managed to basically walk her to another neighborhood. As they were making their way to the man's car, some parents and older kids from my school found them and called the police. I discussed this with my frightened parents later, but I don't remember seeing it on the news or anything. Not only that, but me and Junior were not the only kids who saw the man. Pretty much my whole class had seen him or talked to him in those dark woods. I can't help but wonder what would have happened to the little girl if they hadn't found her, or even what would have happened to me if I were a little less careful. This happened during the summer of 2021. My wife and I were sitting in our living room together. She was playing Minecraft online with our mutual friend while I was watching something on YouTube. It was a very typical weeknight for us and we were both well within our comfort zones at the time. It was probably around 9 p.m. when there was a knock at the door. Now I should probably explain. We had been living in our house for several years by this point long enough for us to know that someone at the door at that time of night was very unusual, so right away, this put us on edge. We live in a very quiet neighborhood, in a quiet town. Nothing threatening really ever happens here. So my wife peeks out the window to try and see who is there. She tells me that she sees a man at the door, between our screen door and close enough to our main door that she can't see his face. Now right away, I didn't want to answer the door, but a little time passes and this guy doesn't leave and knocks again. So against part of my better judgment, I decided to answer the door, but I put the chain lock on first just in case whoever this was tried to immediately force their way in. To my initial relief, when I opened the door, there wasn't a mad attempt to get inside. Instead, I am met with a disheveled, shirtless man standing in the doorway. The man was probably in his 30s, but he was in such a worn state, it was honestly a little hard to tell. He was maybe half a head taller than me, but much thinner, and I seemed to remember him having a lot of tattoos. I definitely remember his body language and the vibe he gave off, though. There was something very... off about him. His eyes kept darting around. Hands were restless and he kept shifting back and forth from one foot to the other. I say to him, Can I help you? He responds, Yeah, can, can, I, uh, can I use your phone? No eye contact during any of this. I very quickly said, No, sorry. Closed the door and locked it. I was not letting this guy into my house. I looked over towards my wife, but my eyes landed on our cat first. She was standing on the arm of the couch, eyes locked on the door, and all of her fur was standing on end. She was absolutely freaked out. I had never seen her react like that to a person before, and haven't seen it happen again since. My wife is still talking to our friend over the phone, their Minecraft world still up in the background during this. Our friend was freaking out, listening to all this happen. I moved over to look out the window myself, and my wife and I both see this guy, still standing at our door, jamming himself as closely to it as he could, and letting the screen door just press up against his back. It almost felt like he was hiding in our doorway. With him not leaving, and no idea what else we could do, I handed my phone to my wife for her to call the police, keeping our friend on the other phone just in case something happened. And during the time my wife was speaking with the police dispatcher, something did happen. The man eventually turns around, but doesn't leave our doorway. Instead, he looks out towards our front yard, into the darkness. I should mention right now that despite living in a typical neighborhood, our end of the street has no street lights, so it is always particularly dark around our house at night. In the porch light, we could see the man talking, 
We couldn't tell what he was saying, but he kept speaking and making gestures towards the darkness, like he was speaking with someone that we couldn't see. Even the thought that there actually could be someone else waiting in the dark was bone-chilling, but I just knew by the way the man was acting that he was speaking to someone that existed only in his head, so he was either on something or he was in the middle of a psychotic episode at our front door, refusing to leave. We kept the police dispatcher and our friend both on their respective phones while we watched this unnerving display continue on, trying to stay hidden behind our blinds the whole time. I didn't really want to take my eyes off him, just in case he tried to move to a window or something similar. I don't know how long we waited there watching this man talk to nothing, but he eventually stared off towards the end of our block for a long period. The talking stopped, and then suddenly he ran off towards the street. We watched him disappear into the darkness. And of course, just a minute or two later, that is when the police arrived. We both gave the police our statements, and they said they would have patrol cars search the neighborhood. After the cop we spoke with left, we closed the door and tried to make sense of what happened. I don't remember everything we discussed, but I do remember that we both realized that the police never went into our backyard to check around our addition. We have a small studio apartment-sized guest house in our backyard that we would rarely use ourselves, but it would be the perfect place for someone to hide out if they broke into it. I don't remember which of us put that together, but I do remember that it was me who decided to go check the guest house. I do realize now how dumb this was, and that I should have waited to hear back from the police first. Instead, I grabbed a flashlight and this thick Irish blackthorn wood walking stick I own, called a shillelagh, and I set about my foolish, nerve-wracking task. I checked the outside of the guest house first, and didn't see any broken windows or other signs that someone tried to enter. So then, I went inside and checked every closet and anywhere I could think of for someone to hide. My mind and heart were both racing the whole time, but fortunately, the house was empty. I headed back into the main house, which I feel like I should mention is a small house despite us having the detached addition. We aren't rich by any definition, that guest house has a whole separate story of its own. My wife and I both just sort of stayed huddled in our living room for a while. All previous thoughts of YouTube and Minecraft, gone. It was a short time later that the police arrived again. They told us that they actually did catch the guy. He was found trying to enter someone's house through a window. That someone also happened to be an off-duty police officer. They did mention that they have had incidents with the man before, and that this night his symptoms seemed pretty bad. Looking back at it now, I hope that man was able to get some help. He very clearly wasn't having a good night that night, but that didn't change the danger he could have been to himself or someone else. And it doesn't change the fact that the whole experience to this day is the most frightening thing to ever happen to me. I was traveling through Europe from mid-August all the way through January. While I was in Greece, I met this really cute, sweet couple named Maggie and David. They were from the UK and lived along the border of England and Scotland, and they invited me to come and stay with them from October to mid-November. Their youngest child was attending university, and they felt like they wanted another youngin' around their cottage house since they found they didn't enjoy the empty nest as much as they thought they would. So, I agreed that when I was finished exploring Thessaloniki, I would come and stay with them and maybe help around the house and see some of the countryside. I don't know why Maggie called it a cottage house. It was much larger than a cottage. Old, definitely. Very fancy, but old. It was very long and narrow. I suppose she called it a cottage because it was out in the country, I don't know if there was any houses for kilometers in any direction. Maggie was just about the sweetest person I had ever met. Still is, 
and her and I talk all the time to this day. I don't really talk to David, but that's because David is just not much of a talker, whereas Maggie was bubbly and warm and loved to tell the stories and jokes. David was more stoic and stern. That isn't to say that he was mean or anything. He was quite friendly, but he just didn't talk very much and certainly didn't joke around and wasn't much of a storyteller. Most of the time, Maggie would be singing in the garden or talking on the phone with somebody while David would just sit in his armchair and read a history book. I spent a lot of time helping them out by chopping a lot of firewood for the fireplace due to the house being drafted and cold quite often. Maggie was really friendly and she introduced me to all of her son's friends and today, in turn, introduced me to some really cute girls and we would leave the countryside and go to the nearest town and get a few pints at the pub. Halloween was soon approaching and we made plans to have some sort of celebration, maybe by going out to one of the old cemeteries and playing with the Ouija board or something. No plans were yet solidified, but we were in the midst of making something. So, that's basically the backstory. Onward with what leads up to the event. The cottage was a long, narrow, one-story house, and I got to stay in the guest bedroom that was located sort of in the middle of the establishment, and it was placed closest to the kitchen. It was my second or third night there, when I woke up in the middle of the night to hear somebody walking upstairs. Now, as I have already established, this was a one-story house, so I was confused. How could somebody be walking up and down stairs when there were no stairs. The first time I heard this, I figured maybe I was in the middle of a dream, perhaps. Or, maybe there was just something outside that was hitting against the walls. Or maybe I was just tripping. I shrugged it off and went back to sleep. The day after, I had completely forgotten about it, as the excitement of being in the UK was overpowering any anticipation I might have felt. I went out with the other folks that Maggie had introduced me to, and went out for more pints at the pub and played darts and other things. I got home late and crawled into bed. It was near midnight now. And there it was again. Unmistakably, it was something walking up and down a set of stairs. I knew I hadn't gone off to sleep at this point because I was still scrolling through my phone for sights to see the next day. Curiosity got the better of me, and I got out of bed and opened the door and peered into the kitchen and down the hallway one direction, and then to the other. But there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. Being a bit spooked and feeling a chill, I approached the fireplace, put a log on it, sat in David's armchair for a moment, and watched the log get eaten by flame when I heard a creaky door close. It wasn't a slam, but it was loud, almost as if the door was heavy. Okay, I said to myself. This is too weird. The morning after at the breakfast table, I casually brought up the stair stepping. You folks got an invisible staircase or something? I joked. Oh, Maggie's face brightened up with a mischievous smile. You hear the steps, don't you? Yeah, I admitted. Don't you worry about him, love. He's just the butler. I was confused at this point. The butler? I asked. You guys have a butler? No, no, silly. Maggie laughed. Here, I'll show you. Maggie gets up from the kitchen table, takes a few steps and removes a corner of a rug, and there's this small sort of hole. It turns out, there was a handle there. Because the next thing I know, Maggie lifts up the floor with this arduous, freaky, creaking sound that revealed a doorway in the middle of the floor. See? She said. We have a wine cellar. Oh! I gasped, surprised. Back in the middle of the 19th century, this house belonged to some high-class people. Royalty and all. This is where the butler slept. Down here. So, you mean... That's right, mate, David said. Our house is haunted. Oh, don't scare him, Davy. Maggie slapped at David's shoulder, continuing to say, Listen, love, most people never even hear the footsteps. Just ignore it. 
The butler's harmless. The phone rang, and Maggie answered it and went into the next room. Aye, the butler's harmless, David said. Then whispering almost to himself, it seemed, he continued, It's the other one you gotta worry about. I asked, The other one? Aye. He leaned forward a bit as he spoke. The lady of the house. You're trying to scare me, aren't you? It's almost Halloween and all, and you're poking at a bit of fun with the foreigner, right? I'm afraid not, mate. David was all seriousness. Like I said, he really wasn't a jokester. This was the most I'd ever heard him even speak. Listen, a long time ago, the lady of this house lost her child after a few weeks of the infant being born, and she became stricken with grief, naturally. Not long after, she went completely mental, or so the story goes. The husband tried to get her help, her family tried to get her help, but nothing was to be done of it. The husband left, many of the servants left, and the only one who stayed was the lady of the house and the loyal butler. Losing a child made her start to become a bit touched, but her husband leaving had made her go completely nutty. The family was concerned, of course, but more so they were embarrassed. It didn't look good for a family of that stature. They wanted to quietly whisk her away and have the lady put into an asylum. The lady of the house found out about this news from the butler herself. Well, after losing her husband and her baby, the last thing she would ever want to lose is her home. She swore that nobody would ever remove her from her house. She swore it. And hearing this information coming not from her closest family, but from her servant, well, that sent her into a rage and paranoia and a sense of betrayal. Rumor has it she poisoned the butler, and he died down there in the cellar. When her family came to have her taken away in a straitjacket and placed into an asylum is when they stumbled upon a horrific stench of a decomposing body down below. She denied nothing. Being dragged out of her house by her own family and by policemen, she swore she would never leave the house. Not completely. She vowed one day, one day, that she would return, and when she returned, she'd be at home for good and forever. Or so the story goes. I was in shock. I was mortified. I couldn't finish eating my breakfast. And the lady? I asked. Well, lad, David said. She's the lady of the house, of course, and she's still here, lingering in the walls, and she's a part of the window panes and the floorboards. She's in the lamplight and in the dark corners. As long as we never forget that, and as long as we are respectful, no worries are needed. I only hear the footsteps, though, I concluded. I'll give it time. David was riding from his chair at the kitchen table. She makes her presence known when she wants you to know. Is she an angry, scary sort of spirit? Well, she doesn't much care for people living in her house, lad. But she's not of this world anymore, so she's not in charge anymore. As much as she would like to be. Davy! Maggie entered the room yelling. What are you telling the boy? David grimaced at her, saying, The truth, Margaret. I was telling him the truth. And with that, David sauntered away and sat at his armchair by the fireplace and began to read the newspaper, like nothing bone-tingling was just dumped on my lap. The next few nights were rough. I had trouble sleeping. As soon as the footsteps up and down the stairs started, my hair would stand on the back of my neck, and I became paralyzed. Too scared to open my eyes and search the room. I couldn't help but shake the feeling someone was in the room with me, standing in the dark corner, behind the shadows, just glaring at me with disapproval. This could have all been in my mind. I understand. I heard a scary story, and the next thing I knew I was convincing myself I was not imagining things. It happens to everyone, right? 
For three nights in a row, I lay in bed too scared to move until the break of dawn, and if I had to use the bathroom, I just held it. On the fourth night after the story, I lay in bed, shivering. The footsteps began, and then there was a knock at my bedroom door. M- Ma- Maggie, is is that you? No answer. David? Hello? No answer. Then there was a scratch, scratch, scratch on the other side of the door. It had been holding up until that point. But shortly after I relieved myself unknowingly and lay in a wet puddle, still too horrified to move. The morning after was Halloween. I did my laundry because, well, yeah, because of my little accident. After it was all done, I didn't spend much more time in the house. I hung out with some friends that I had made in the village, and we lounged about, basically. Before it got dark, everybody had to go home and meet up with their families, and we decided we would all reconvene later that night. I was dropped off at the cottage, and I hesitantly went inside. Maggie and David were by the fireplace watching television. I didn't want to be alone, so I sat on the sofa and watched some sitcom with them. I couldn't understand a word of it, though. The dialect and the slang were all still very foreign to me. It didn't matter, though. It's not like I was able to focus anyway. It was nearing dark, and I found myself constantly peering out the window, hoping to see the headlights of one of my friend's cars approaching. No such luck. Boom. A door slammed. The lights all went out. The television turned off. Pitch black. Silence. Bloody hell, Maggie said. She's here. The lights flickered back on quickly. The television turned back on to a blue screen. Boom. Another door slammed across the hallway. David yelled. Get out of here, lady. I cowered in fear, balling up in the corner of the sofa. Another door across the hall opened so violently its doorknob hit the wall. Then, there was total silence. Suddenly, faintly, a crying sound was heard. Oh, she's at it again, Maggie said. Seeing me absolutely petrified on the sofa, she came and sat down next to me and held me. The crying turned into a woeful sobbing. Louder and louder it grew, traveling about the house, through the hallway, in and out of bedrooms. Boom! Another door slammed. The lights went out. Pitch black. The violent sobbing turned into screaming. A lamp by the TV flickered on. Then off. Then on. Then off. The kitchen light turned on. Boom! Another door slammed. Then it violently was thrust open. Then it slammed again. Then the screaming turned into some sort of shrieking. Maggie was holding me tighter, which only scared me more. I didn't know if she was scared too, or if she was just trying to comfort me. Then, I had a disturbing thought. What if this isn't Maggie clutching me in the dark? It was too dark to see. So how could I know? Next thing I knew, all the doors in the house violently opened and were stopped by the walls. A terrible woman's voice wailed. Get out! The lights came on, and I ran out the open front door like a little kid who just saw a monster. For all I knew, I did just experience a monster, and it had turned me into every bit as vulnerable as a little girl. I got to the road and stood there, crouched, panting heavily, until one of my friends pulled up. I got in the car and began crying, sobbing, shaking. What's with you, man? My friend asked, her hand worriedly resting upon my shoulder. I tried to explain, many times. I don't think she ever knew what to make of it. I don't know if she believed me. Obviously, she knew I was upset. I was a bummer for everyone to be around that night, and we didn't do much Halloween celebrating. I kind of killed the mood. I spent the night at one of my friend's houses, and the next day they came with me to help me go inside and grab my stuff from the guest bedroom. 
and then they took me to a hotel where I stayed for my duration in the UK. I still speak with Maggie and David, and Maggie especially feels awful. I know she wasn't trying to deceive me. As she said, people rarely heard the footsteps, and she explained the lady of the house never attacked when there were guests. The incident was such a rare occurrence that even Maggie and David themselves were surprised. I don't know how anybody could ever live in such a house. Every Halloween, I think about this event, and it has stuck with me in some of my nightmares and my daydreams. I certainly believe now that All Hallows' Eve is a paper-thin portal for spirits to easily enter our realm and make their intentions known, good or bad. Many spirits I can feel sorry for, some I don't. But never again do I want to be anywhere near the Lady of the House. Twenty-six-year-old Deborah Deanne Poe grew up in Northern Virginia near Washington, D.C., eventually moving to Orlando, Florida in late October of 1989. Whilst in Orlando, Deborah rented a duplex with a female roommate, fostering dreams of purchasing her own home with the profits she had hoped to make from her fledgling catering company. In order to realize said dreams, Deborah worked two jobs in the Orlando area, one being in a sales department of the Orlando Sentinel newspaper, and the other working five nights a week as a clerk at a Circle K convenience store on the intersection of Hall Road and Aloma Avenue, where she was entirely alone whilst on the job. Scott Iagi, another clerk at the Circle K, who also happened to be Deborah's boyfriend, handed over his shift to her at around 11 p.m. on February the 3rd, 1990. Two hours later, Scott returned to the Circle K to see how Deborah was holding up. She was relatively new to the company, and was blessed that her boyfriend was willing to put time aside to assist her in her nightly duties. Once Scott was sure that she would be okay, he drove home to get some rest, expecting a call from Deborah once she had finished her shift at around 7 a.m. Yet he never received one. Shortly after 3 a.m. on the morning of February 4th, a friend of Deborah's happened to be driving by the Circle K store. She attests that she saw Deborah behind the counter, clearly recognizing her distinct hairstyle from some distance away. However, around a half hour later, a customer parked up in her vehicle in the Circle K's parking lot and walked inside of the store to buy a pack of cigarettes. This particular customer was a regular visitor at the time of night, given that she too worked the late night shift at her job. So even though Deborah had only worked there for a short time, she had become accustomed to seeing the sleepy-eyed young clerk behind the counter. But to her surprise, when she walked in that night, it wasn't Deborah on duty. In fact, the man who stood behind the counter didn't appear to be an employee of Circle K at all, given that instead of the usual uniform, he was wearing a black Megadeth t-shirt emblazoned with a fire-breathing dragon. The customer inquired if he was a new employee, to which the strange man replied in the affirmative. She then asked where Deborah was, and was confused when the strange man didn't seem to know who she was. After all, the Circle K team were a close-knit bunch and included a romantic couple, but if this young man was indeed a new employee, it was perfectly understandable that he might not be entirely familiar with his colleagues yet, so his answer didn't arouse too much suspicion. The customer shrugged it off, then asked the clerk for a pack of their favorite cigarette brand. Yet not only did the strange man not seem to be familiar with where the cigarettes were located, or which brand was which, he seemed to have a great deal of trouble operating the register too. Yet as with her previous inquiry, the customer simply put it down to the teething pains of a new hire, and calmly waited for her change as the strange man pushed one button after another before the cash register finally popped open. As she left the store, she heard the strange man lean over the counter and say, You really shouldn't smoke, you know. In a tone that left her feeling distinctly creeped out. Then, just another half hour later, 
another customer walked into the Circle K, only to find it completely deserted. They called out for service, but no one came to their assistance. Something didn't sit right with them at all, and so they made the decision to call the local sheriff's department to warn them that something bad may have happened. Police arrived a short while later to discover that Deborah's red Toyota was still in the parking lot, all locked up. Yet strangely, they found that not only were her purse and paycheck still in the car, but also that her actual car keys were locked inside too. On inspecting the interior of the Circle K store, the cops then found what they assumed was Deborah's Circle K uniform, folded and neatly placed behind the counter. The register was secured. There was no obvious sign of theft of either cash or product. Nothing was remotely out of place. It was as if that night, Deborah had simply vanished into thin air. A canine police unit was called in, and the dog handler gave his canine a whiff of Deborah's uniform, instructing it to follow the scent. The search dog then rushed around to the rear of the store building, alerting on two distinct spots in a section of pavement. The first was a patch of concrete behind a derelict business just next to the Circle K. The other seemed to be through a gap in a large, wooden fence that led into the parking lot of a neighboring apartment complex. After that, the search dog seemed to lose her trail. The sudden loss of the scent trail led investigating sheriff's deputies to conclude that Deborah had either willingly entered a vehicle which promptly drove off, or had done so under duress. But since Deborah hadn't returned to either her job, her boyfriend, or her rented apartment, the only real question was who might want to abduct the hardworking and personable young woman. What quickly became obvious to investigators was the solitary nature of Deborah's work made her a very easy and obvious target for kidnapping. She was an attractive young woman, working alone in a gas station in the middle of the night, at a time when there were no CCTV cameras present to record the interior or exterior of the business. According to her boyfriend, there was also no shortage of bothersome customers to include on the list of suspects, some of whom harmlessly flirted with Deborah. Others, she complained, had made some legitimately predatory remarks to her when they came in drunk in the wee small hours. Her boyfriend told the police on one particular incident that Deborah complained of, which occurred just a fortnight prior to the apparent abduction. According to her, a semi-naked man ran into the Circle K and hopped over the counter, where he then attempted to indecently assault her. Deborah was then pursued around the store for a few minutes, then chased outside to the gas pumps, where she was able to evade the man and make it back to the store before him, where she promptly locked the doors to keep him out. It was only when Deborah had secured a full-time sales position at the Orlando Sentinel that her family and boyfriend pleaded with her to quit working at the Circle K, citing the dangers of working alone in the middle of the night. However, Deborah refused, arguing that she needed the extra hours in order to raise funds to put towards starting up that dream catering business of hers. As a kind of compromise, Scott began to accompany her to work, remaining in his car while she worked, and drinking coffee to stay awake so that he could keep an eye on her. But this only irritated Deborah, who complained that she didn't need to be chaperoned, especially when her boyfriend should be at home getting the sleep he needed to complete his own full-time hours. After collecting statements from various eyewitnesses, police decided their investigation should focus around the creepy-sounding Megadeth fan who was behind the counter when the smoker arrived to buy cigarettes. The Orlando Sentinel ran a missing persons ad in the classified section every day for 11 years after her abduction, ending in December 2001, but information yielded from the ads proved useless. Yet after more than 30 years and hundreds of tips from the general public, this man has yet to be identified. There were also some doubts that he was even involved in her disappearance at all, given that he could have walked into the store, possibly drunk, saw that there was no one behind the counter, and decided to play at being a clerk for an hour or so. But it would have to be something of an extraordinary coincidence that he had been present in the store just a matter of minutes after she was supposedly abducted. Either way, 
Police were never able to identify or question the man, and so his identity and level of involvement remain a complete mystery. In the immediate aftermath of Deborah's disappearance, police were not in a position to go public with all of the information they had to hand, since they were worried that it might frighten their suspect into fleeing the area altogether. But after three months of no luck in their investigation, Orange County Sheriff's Department held a press conference in which they revealed a composite sketch of the so-called Megadeth Man. He was believed to be aged between 19 and 25, with long, wiry, dark hair and brown eyes. Aside from the Megadeth t-shirt he was wearing on the night in question, a witness had described him as wearing a skull ring on his left hand, along with a crucifix piercing dangling from his right ear. But perhaps most importantly, a black van had been parked outside at the time of his appearance, one with a large, colorful Megadeth mural airbrushed into the side. It was believed that this detail would make him easy to identify, since such a vehicle was likely to be very memorable and somewhat unique. Then, in August of 1990, a man riding an ATV made a grisly discovery near Aloma Avenue, a road that was only two miles away from where Deborah was last seen alive. It was a decomposing human corpse, mostly skeletal, and due to the geographical and physical similarities, it was believed to be Deborah's. However, much to the relief of her family and friends, the jewelry on the corpse was found to bear no similarities to that which they knew that Deborah owned, and after a comparison was made between the corpse's bite pattern and Deborah's dental records, the possibility of it being the missing clerk was ruled out. It gave her family hope, hope that she might still be alive. Over a year after the corpse's discovery, in November of 1991, Deborah's case was featured on the popular TV show Unsolved Mysteries. Over 150 viewers from all over the country called in with fresh information, most of which involved the identity or location of the Megadeth man seen behind the counter that night. Orange County Police also received a call from law enforcement officials up in Virginia who told them they were investigating a remarkably similar case and actually had a suspect in their custody who matched the physical description of the Megadeth man. However, despite the physical similarities, detectives were unable to charge the man up in Virginia and were forced to investigate other suspects during the following few years one of which was an ex-boyfriend of Deborah's, who she had broken up with, citing mental instability. Another came to the attention of detectives as late as 1998, following reports that he would talk constantly about Deborah's disappearance with an apparently unhealthy interest. But once he was confronted by police, the man simply lawyered up and refused to talk about it anymore, subsequently dodging a charge for her abduction. Almost 12 years later, in March of 2002, a large team of Orange County Sheriff's deputies and volunteer search and rescue personnel assembled in an empty lot behind the Chapel Hill Baptist Church on Trevarthen Road in Orlando. They spent around 14 hours intensively searching the one-acre lot, which was only around three and a half miles from the Circle K gas station, having identified it as a possible location for Deborah's remains. Their reasoning was that it was in close proximity to the home of a new suspect in the case, but refused to say just who that was in reference to. That day, five of the six search canines present alerted to there having been human remains in an overgrown section of the field, yet the 12 hours of excavation that followed yielded nothing of significance, although that didn't rule out that Deborah's body had been buried there following her murder and then moved at some point during the early stages of the investigation into her disappearance. However, terrifyingly enough, local news reporters discovered that this location was close to the apartment of none other than Deborah's boyfriend at the time of her disappearance, Scott Iagi, the very same man who had been so insistent that the blame lay with the men harassing her, was now the prime suspect in what was, by that point, assumed to be her murder, yet he too was never officially charged with any crime. 
It has been more than 30 years since Deborah Deanne Poe disappeared from her job at the Circle K gas station in Orlando, Florida. 30 leads of dead ends, bad leads and failed charges. There have been no human remains discovered that have ever been successfully identified as belonging to her. No one has ever come forward claiming to be her, and no one has ever confessed to her murder. For intents and purposes, Deborah simply vanished from thin air that night, never to be seen again. Even as the world ventured into the era of camera phones, internet media, and communities of people obsessed with unsolved mysteries, there have been no significant developments in her case. Thirty years later, the question remains, just what exactly did happen to Deborah Deanne Poe? Back in 2017, my husband and I were touring homes for sale with a family member. On this particular day, we toured a home that was once a duplex and had since been converted into a large family home. It was an older home that needed some cosmetic work, but it was a beautiful space with a large front porch, a large yard, and even a garage with a workspace. Despite admiring the charm of the old house, I started feeling ill almost immediately after arriving. I thought it was strange, but brushed it off and continued to check out the rest of the home. We toured room after room without any problem until we reached one of the upstairs bedrooms. There was a large closet tucked away in the far corner of the bedroom. My husband and I decided to check it out while our family member and the real estate agent looked over the rest of the room. My husband opened the door took a step inside, and proceeded to pull the chain on the closet light. As he reached for the chain, a chill suddenly ran down my spine. Almost as soon as the light turned on, there was a loud pop. The light surged and quickly went dark. My husband turned around to look at me, and his face went white. I whipped around to see what had caused him to react this way, but I saw nothing. He refused to say what he saw in the presence of the realtor and our family member. We finished touring the upper floor, my husband and I growing more antsy to leave as time passed. The realtor then led us into the basement. As we moved down the stairs and into the middle of the space, the ill feeling I had had since we arrived suddenly intensified. I felt nauseous, weak, and short of breath. My limbs felt heavy, and I was sure I was going to pass out. I told my husband I didn't feel well, and I needed to leave. We excused ourselves and made our way to the porch. As I sat on the front steps, the ill feeling was gone, but my entire body was shaking. The realtor and our family member soon joined us. The realtor offered to show us the garage. My husband and I declined and asked to meet up at the next home. Once we were back in the car and driving away from the property, I was completely fine, as if the whole incident in the basement had never happened. My husband then looked at me with wide eyes and told me what he had seen when the closet light went out. When he turned around to look at me, there was an old man with large glasses standing directly behind me with an incredibly angry look on his face. He was there only for a split second, and by the time I had turned around, he was already gone. The rest of our day touring homes was completely normal. I never felt that ill feeling again, and we had no other odd experiences. Several days later, my husband told a coworker he was close to about the weird experience we had had in the house. As it turned out, his coworker knew a middle-aged man who lived in that home several years prior. He was a trade worker who enjoyed his solitude didn't appreciate being bothered by outsiders, and apparently had a pretty bad temper. He was very protective of his home and of his space, especially the workshop in his garage where he had spent a lot of his time. He died of a heart attack in that garage. Looking back on that day, I'm thankful we chose to pass on the rest of the tour. 
after what we experienced in the house. I don't want to imagine what it would have been like to intrude in his favorite place. This was when I was still living on a farm. Back then, I was too young to understand what really happened, but thinking about it now, it was not just my imagination. There was always an uneasy feeling in that house. It always felt like you were being watched. As a child, I could never stand to look out my window when it was dark, because it felt like something was waiting for me to see it. I always believed that if I sleep with my face to the wall, nothing would harm me until that night. I was getting into bed when I noticed that my curtains weren't completely closed, so of course I went to close it when something caught my eye outside. I saw the moon, and it was glowing red and lighting up our backyard. That's when I saw it. There was a dark figure standing in the tree line. The fear I felt was so strong it made it hard to breathe. I'm just standing there keeping my eyes locked on the dark figure, hoping that I'm not really seeing what I think I'm seeing. Then it started to move towards me. I finally got my body to move, and I ducked and closed the curtains just trying to catch my breath. When I finally got the courage to peek out again, it was gone. I ran to my dad's room, waking him up frantically. He got his weapon and checked around the house. He came back after a while and told me that there was nothing to go back to sleep. I tried to protest, but he said it must have been my eyes playing tricks on me. So I decided to believe him, and I went to bed laying awake and listening to the sounds from outside. I must have fallen asleep because the next moment I heard a loud bang that woke me up. I was fully awake, but when I got out of bed to check if anyone else heard it, Everyone was still asleep. Thinking it must have been nothing, I went back to my room. I got into bed, but when I turned out my lamp, I saw the moon shining through my curtains. And there it was. The dark figure was inside my room, slowly coming towards me. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. It was like all the air in my lungs were stolen. I was frozen in fear with my mind hitting blanks. I was a sitting duck. I finally just pulled the covers over my head, hoping it would help. I felt its presence right next to me. I couldn't breathe. I felt the weight of whatever it was sit down next to me on my bed. All I could do was cry. It felt like I was stuck with that thing for hours. I kept telling myself it's just my imagination or a dream, just begging for this not to be a reality. I peeked out from under my covers to find nothing, just my teddy bear next to me. I don't know how, but I somehow fell asleep again, as per usual, with my face to the wall. A while later, I awoke again, and as soon as I opened my eyes, I saw the figure crawling from under my bed, grasping the wall. It grabbed onto me. I was paralyzed. Its cold claws were holding my face. It was trying to tell me something. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't do anything. Then, as suddenly as it all started, it ended. I woke up and realized it was a nightmare. I heard my dad telling me to get up and get ready for school. While just a moment ago, that thing was inches away from my face. I never saw it again, but there were some small things that happened throughout our time living there, but nothing like what I experienced that night. To this day, I have no idea what it was or what it was trying to tell me. This happened when my family and I had just moved into our new home. It's located on 11.5 acres of land and has a pond 
and many trees. So as you could probably imagine, it was huge. Once we got there, we began cleaning and putting some camping chairs and air mattresses in, just until we were able to get our furniture in. And everything was great for the first couple days. Tiring, but great. Soon enough, we made it a habit to sit around the end of the kitchen near the living room and in front of the two decently sized windows facing the deck and the backyard of the land. We usually gather there at night and talk for a couple hours before going to bed. And this night in particular, nothing was different. We gathered around as usual and began chatting about daily things as my mom washed the dishes. Note, it was about 10.30 p.m. There was a window above our sink, facing the back part of the land as well, but when it was night, you couldn't see a thing. Just pitch darkness. As we were talking, my mom suddenly screamed. Thinking she had seen a giant bug, I didn't think much of it. That was until I heard what she said right after. There's a man outside. My mom described it as looking up and just seeing a white face staring directly at her. She said that once she looked at him, he motioned for her to come outside. My dad got up and headed straight for the door, opening it without hesitation and confronting the man while me and my brother stood quietly in the kitchen. It was still a terrifying situation, and not being prepared for anything like this, we had no idea what to do. I kept my thumb over the emergency call button as I listened to my dad speak to the strange man. How did you get in here? My dad asked. The man didn't give a specific answer, but we knew he had jumped the fence and the gate. But he only said that he drove up to the gate and wanted my dad to sell him the tractors that were on our land when we first purchased it. You need to leave, man, I heard my dad say. Didn't want any trouble, I heard the man reply in a quiet and eerie tone. I'll come back on Friday. And that's when he left. We watched him walk to his car, get in, and drive away. And if you're wondering, no, he didn't end up coming back, which makes me think he wasn't really here for the tractors. This story takes place in 2012. I was 22 years old and stationed at Fort Carson in Colorado Springs. Myself and a few of my army buddies had decided to head to one of the local bowling alleys on a Saturday night. Nothing crazy, just wanted to get out of the barracks for a bit. A few games and a few beers later, one of my friends, N, shot out the idea to our group. Who wants to go to Gold Camp Road? I heard a few sighs and looked to see myself as well as a few others had a, what are you talking about, look all over their faces. It's haunted. It's creepy, and it's better than bowling. Come on, who's in? Most of us agreed. Myself, I loved anything and everything spooky and paranormal, so I wasted no time in throwing in my, hell yeah. So it was settled. We finished our drinks and headed out the door. By now, I was getting really excited. What was turning out to be just a dull, regular Saturday night at a local bowling alley was now turning into something way more interesting. There was two vehicles carrying all of us, so as we headed towards this infamous Gold Camp Road, I was told the story that goes with it. Because there's always a story, isn't there? Whether there's any actual truth to the story I'm about to tell you, I'm not sure. But what we experienced out there did happen. Tucked away in Teller County and running through North Cheyenne Canyon, the road is 8.6 miles one way. It has an eerie history. It's said to be haunted. Set into the hills of Colorado Springs Bear Creek Park, in the 1880s a railroad was built from Cripple Creek to Colorado Springs during the gold rush. In 1922, it ceased its activities and was converted into a highway in 1924. The new road had three tunnels. One of them is said to have collapsed around 1988 when a school bus full of orphans collided with it killing the driver and all the children aboard. 
After the incident, the tunnels are said to be severely haunted, and while this is just superstition, the threatening claws of the fence guarding one of the tunnels aren't doing anything to discourage the stories. While most of these claims have been made about the closed third tunnel, others have reported strange occurrences in the two remaining as well. The collapsed tunnel is sealed off by huge gates and located past where cars can easily drive. This location is a popular hangout for high schoolers and teens, especially on summer nights. Various stories surround what makes these tunnels haunted. When the tunnels were built in the 1800s, it's said that many workers died in actually building the tunnels. There have been rumblings of a school bus accident ranging from a suicidal driver to an oncoming train. Nowadays, hikers report hearing laughter in the area, and cars able to get close enough have found tiny handprints in window fog. Today, people drive through the second tunnel waiting for the car to be moved after putting it in park and turning off the lights. Others have claimed to see apparitions of men in cloaks. The third tunnel, you are not able to drive through, but many peer in, wondering the secrets of this spooky spot. As we slowly climbed the one-way dirt road, I was told the story about the kids and the bus. I'm not gonna lie, most of it wasn't really hitting. Every town has a story like this, right? Where you go on this road, and on this night, and stop here and you'll see the ghost of XYZ. It's always a road or a bridge. I've spent a lot of my life checking out creepy abandoned places, graveyards, supposed haunted locations, so this was just going to be another I add to my list that was really cool to see. Hear the story, then be on my way a few hours later, with nothing of note happening. As we went through the first tunnel, I was excited and really in awe of how long this road was, and beautiful the city looked as we drove higher and higher. Same result as we went through the second tunnel. Now before we got to the third tunnel, there was a spot to park. Because I was told we can't drive through the third, and we would have to get out and walk. We all got out, and were just talking, laughing, and had a few more beers. A few of my buddies and I even shot off some guns. Stupid, I know. I was 22, a little drunk, and not using my best judgment. After all that died down, myself and two of my army buddies walked over to the third tunnel, and they showed me how it was gated up, but you could squeeze behind it. There was a lot of trash and beer cans around, looking like there had been plenty of people coming out here for a while, doing the same thing we were. Again, nothing of note. It was cool to see, but no scary ghost sightings no phantom bus or kid screaming. So after 15 minutes or so, we walked back to our cars, and not long after that, we talked about just heading out, since nothing was happening, and it was starting to get pretty late. I'd say it was around 2.30 a.m. at this point. It took us at least 25 to 30 minutes to climb up this mountain. It's pretty much a one-way road that winds and curves, so you have to drive very slowly. So I think we were all just over it and ready to head back down. Not long before we jumped back in the vehicles, D, one of my friends, kept reiterating that he was hearing something off in the distance. Kids, I swear I can hear something that sounded like a kid. I was laughing at him like, okay, dude, yeah, sure you did. N came out to our vehicle, started dumping baby powder all over our cars. Jay, the driver, was like, What are you doing? He stated that the lore and legend says that if you put baby powder on the cars as you drive up or down the mountain, you will see handprints all over your car afterwards. So we rolled our eyes and let him finish, and then jumped in. N and a few others were in an SUV in front of us, and we were in a sports car. They were a decent distance ahead of us, so it was weird, when all of a sudden, two headlights appeared around the bend following us. At first, we were asking one another, was there another car up there? No, there wasn't. We were all the way at the top, and there was no other vehicles parked up there with us, and the last and third tunnel was gated off. You can't get any sized vehicle through it. At this point, Jay is a little freaked out, 
and I am uncomfortable with that thought. The car would fly right up on us, would almost hit us, and then would back off, repeating this over and over for about 10 minutes, I'd say. Driving down a curved and windy one-lane road without guardrails is nerve-wracking enough, but with a vehicle right up on you, it made it 100 times more intense. Finally, the car backed off with the headlights disappearing about halfway down the mountain. We looked at one another exchanging the WTF was that about glance, and right as I looked back toward the road, we saw it. A man walking up the mountain. 2.45 in the morning, and there was a man walking up this mountain. His head was down, and he had a beard and long hair, so his face was covered. The one thing about all this that stood out was that he was wearing one of those green and yellow reflective jackets as well. We both verbally were like, whoa, what? What is that guy doing? As we continued down, I'm now actually kind of freaked out because there's too many things happening that are just downright weird. There was no sign of another vehicle parked off the side of the road as we drove on. Like the guy parked off and just wanted to go for a late night walk up a mountain. As weird and as crazy as this sounds, he looked like a bus driver. I don't think either of us ever said that out loud to one another, but I know we were both thinking it. Jay and I finally make it down the mountain ten or so minutes later. Nerves are shot, and we are ready to just go back to the barracks and call it a night. Jay wanted to stop and get some gas, a drink to calm his nerves, so we stopped at a nearby gas station. I walked inside as he was getting gas and grabbed us two waters. As I came back out, I stopped dead in my tracks as I got up to the rear of his car. Jay, you gotta come see this, man. Dude, what? What are you talking about? As he twisted the cap back on and closed his door to the gas tank, he looked at me and then slowly turned to see what I was staring at. Jay's back windshield was completely covered in small, tiny handprints. All that baby powder that N dumped on his car earlier. It was there. It really happened. I was at a loss for words. Was I really seeing this? Jay immediately said, Oh, heck no. Took the water from my hands and dumped it all over them and wiped it all off. He kept muttering to himself, Heck no, heck no, under his breath as he wiped it off. He and I got back in his car, and we never spoke about it again to one another for some reason. And we never again went back to Gold Camp Road. A dark place. That's where I loved to be. It made me feel safe and helped hide my secret. But it wasn't a normal secret like kissing a girlfriend in a closet or trying to take sexy pictures of myself. No, I didn't care for that. What I cared about was smoking a cigarette, which was actually what I was doing. The closet where I was hiding smelled like cigarette smoke, and I coughed hard because of that smoke. I then sighed softly, thinking about how I got to this point. I never wanted to smoke, but everywhere I had been or gone, I saw people smoking, and one day I figured out I should try it for myself. And that's where the problems began. Instead of buying groceries or important stuff, I would buy cigarettes of any kind I could lay my hands on. Just then, the closet door swung open, and my mother... A nice blonde-haired lady stood there with a dark glare on her face and her arms crossed. Jackson, what on earth are you doing? My mother snapped at me. I looked away from my mother. I didn't want to tell her, and I knew she already knew. Mom then grabbed me from under the arm before taking me out of the closet and marching me into the living room. Then Mom threw me onto the couch, and she ripped the cigarette out of my hand and blew it out. I thought we agreed you wouldn't do this anymore, Mom said, holding up the cigarette. 
but I knew I couldn't stop because I had been smoking ever since my dad died. When I was 18, my dad had died in a car crash, and I felt horrible seeing my mother upset and knowing that my dad wouldn't see me grow up anymore. Jackson, you're 21 years old and you're still freaking smoking? You know I hate the house smelling like smoke. Mom snapped at me. Well, you shouldn't have let Dad drive the car when he was drunk. I shouted at her. Mom gasped at what I had said, and she even seemed shocked. I then got up from the couch and headed out of the room. Mom followed behind me, explaining that she was sorry for what she said. But I didn't care. All I did was just shrug her off, saying I would be home later, and then walked out the front door, slamming the door behind myself. It's not your fault, Jackson. None of it is. I mumbled under my breath as I walked down the street. I then headed to the park. It had a place in my heart. A dark place, because it's where I had my first cigarette. The day seemed clear in my mind. Me and a couple of friends were hanging out at the park when one of them broke out a pack of cigarettes. When they asked if I wanted one, I said no at first. But then, after some peer pressure... I took one and started smoking it. The first time I sucked in the smoke, it made me cough, and my friends laughed at me. But after that first one, I got used to it, and then all the rest was history. When I sat down on a bench, I pulled out my pack of cigarettes from my jacket pocket. Oh, crap. I hissed when I realized the cigarette pack was empty. I then remembered I had used that last one when I was sitting in the closet. So instead, I just decided to sit on the bench and let the outdoor noises fill my ears. Maybe my life would be better if I wasn't alive. Maybe my mom would be happier if I had died along with dad. A few hours later, I stood up and decided to head home. But first I wanted to stop by the store and grab another pack. As I was walking... I suddenly stopped and looked up. I noticed I was standing in front of a small grocery store. Without another word, I walked into the store and looked around. It was dusty and old looking inside. I noticed there were spider webs in the corners, and then I thought I saw a rat run past my feet. When I got to the front counter, I noticed no one was there. But I noticed there was a silver bell sitting there. Hello? Hello? I shouted out loud. No one answered, so I hit the bell, ringing it. Then I waited. Suddenly, an older man appeared from nowhere. Welcome to Supernatural Stuff. I'm your wonderful shopkeeper, Mr. Knight. How may I help you, young man? The man grinned and asked. I didn't say anything. I was just looking at the man. He had black and gray hair, and one eye was completely white, and he was wearing all black. Um, do you have any cigarettes? I asked nervously. Yes, I do, Mr. Knight replied with a smile. A few seconds later, Mr. Knight placed a pack of cigarettes in front of me, which I picked up. The box was white and gold, and then I noticed in bold black letters the word pleasure on the front of the box, right in the middle. Do you like them? Mr. Knight asked in a mysterious voice. I just nodded, then reaching into my pocket and pulled out my wallet, ready to pay the man. Oh no, young man, they are free of charge. Just think of it as a gift from me to you, Mr. Knight said, holding up his hands. I don't have to pay you? I asked him, confused. No, you don't, young man. But I would wait until you get home to use them, Mr. Knight said. I nodded before looking down to put the cigarettes in my pocket. And when I looked up, Mr. Knight was gone. What? Where did he go? I mumbled under my breath. I didn't stick around. I then headed home to think about what had happened in the store. When I got home, I heard people talking and laughing, and I growled under my breath. 
My mom's friends were over, and they were probably chatting and drinking tea like they always did. So I headed to my room, where I shut the door behind myself and sat on the edge of my bed. I pulled out the strange cigarettes, looking at them, wondering what Mr. Knight meant by what he said. I opened the pack and pulled out a cigarette, and I noticed it looked like a normal one, which confused me. I then lit the cigarette and started smoking it. When I blew the smoke out of my mouth, I noticed it was black. What? I mumbled under my breath. I then coughed hard and rolled my eyes. Then I continued smoking it, and a minute later, I was done. I sighed softly, thinking about going downstairs to see my mom's friends, but I didn't want them to smell smoke on me. Suddenly, I felt tired. I looked up. My brain felt like it was going numb, and I looked at the pack that was sitting next to me on the bed. I need another one, I said without emotion in my voice. When I blinked, I jumped off the bed, breathing heavily. The box of cigarettes was now on the ground, and all of them were scattered all over the place. I then placed a hand on my chest and noticed that I felt like a zombie for a short time, which made me feel worried. Just then there was a knock at my bedroom door, and I gasped before I started picking up the cigarettes. Honey, are you doing okay? I heard Mom ask me. I didn't say anything after I picked the box and all the cigarettes up. I hid them in my sock drawer before my mom could come in. Then I opened the door and smiled weakly at my mom, who stood there looking worried. Uh, Hi, are you okay? Do you need something? I asked, smiling again at her. I came to ask if you were okay. Did you calm down? Mom asked me. I nodded and yawned. I felt tired and then rubbed my eyes, wanting to fall asleep. Honey, are you sure you're doing well? You look really tired, Mom said, sounding concerned. Mom, chill, I'm fine. Maybe I just need to get some shut-eye, and I'll feel better in the morning. I explained. Without another word, I closed my bedroom door and kicked my shoes off, then fell asleep in my bed with my clothes still on. A few hours later, I bolted upright and looked around, confused at first, and then I rubbed my eyes. It was dark inside my room, and dark outside. I grabbed my phone, which was on my nightstand, and looked at the time. It was three in the morning, which made me confused and made the phone fall out of my hand. I slept for that long? I mumbled under my breath. Then I thought about going downstairs to eat something, or getting a glass of water, to wash it down my throat. I then got out of bed and headed downstairs, noticing that Mom was sleeping in her room too. I then got to the kitchen, turning the small overhead light on, and turned on the sink faucet, getting myself a glass of water. Jackson, a voice behind me said. I turned around with the glass in my hand. I was expecting to see my mom standing there, but no one was there. Suddenly, I heard something breathing heavily behind me, and I felt confused. Don't you want another one? A voice whispered in my ear. I jumped out of fear and dropped the glass on the ground, which caused it to shatter. A few seconds later, I heard footsteps, and my mom ran into the room and stopped when she saw the glass all over the floor. Jackson McCormick, what on earth did you do? Mom shouted. I don't know, I was just getting a glass of water, and then something, someone whispered into my ear, and then I dropped the glass. I explained, looking around. The next morning, I was sitting on the couch. I had an argument with Mom about the glass, and when I told her what happened, she didn't believe me. What happened last night? I mumbled under my breath while rubbing the back of my neck. I heard mom talking on the phone, probably with one of her friends, and I sighed quietly. Then, without another word, I stood up and headed out of the house, 
and headed to my spot in the park. I took out one of the pleasure cigarettes and examined it, attempting to figure out how it worked. I started trying to break it or unroll it, but I stopped. I had the same feeling wash over me the first time I smoked one of those cigarettes. I can't hurt them, I said in a dazed voice. I looked at my hands, and then I stopped messing with the cigarette. I lit the cigarette, sticking it in my mouth like I always did. I was smoking, looking at the ground, wondering what had happened to me last night. And I coughed hard again. I stopped when I heard laughter. I looked up and noticed there was a little girl standing in front of me wearing all black. Hello, Jackie. Do you want to play with me? She asked, grinning at me. I just... I cut myself off and started staring at the girl. Suddenly, the little girl started laughing. At first, it was cute. But then it started to get dark and seemed more evil. Then the girl abruptly coughed and black goo shot out of her mouth, which was also running down out of her nose. She then lunged at me, which caused me to scream in fear, and I fell off the bench and landed on the ground. The girl was on top of me. Her eyes were completely black now, and the black liquid was running down her face and out of the corners of her mouth. The black liquid was dripping onto me, and some landed on my cheek, which caused me to scream in pain, because it was hot. Only one a day, remember that. The girl hissed at me. More black liquid landed on my face, and I cried out in fear and pain, telling the girl to stop and to leave me alone. But she just kept laughing, darkly. More black liquid hit my face, and I cried out. Then the little girl giggled, and when I opened my eyes, she was gone. I immediately jumped up, dusted myself off, and rubbed my cheek. And I knew it hurt. I then ran home, and when I got into my house, I leaned against the wall, breathing heavily. I hoped my mom was still at work, but she walked into the front hall, and she was wearing an apron. Jackson? Jackson, where did you go? Mom asked and looked confused. I didn't say anything. I noticed there was flour on Mom's apron, and I tried to cover the burnt part of my cheek. Oh my gosh, what happened to your cheek? Mom cried out, running over to me. My mother grabbed me by the face and gently touched the burned area. I groaned under my breath, and my mom looked very worried. Mom, I said, looking at her. But Mom wasn't listening. She was trying to fix the accident that had happened on my cheek. I tried to get her attention again, but it didn't work. She was complaining to me about my accident. Mom, 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 leave me alone, I shouted, shoving her away from me. Jackson, what on earth are you doing? Mom asked. What are you doing? I'm not a baby anymore. Stop treating me like one. I'm fine, and I've already told you I'm fine. I shouted at her. I headed for the stairs, and Mom followed behind me, talking without stopping. Mom, shut up! I yelled at her so loudly that it hurt my throat. I then headed to my room and slammed the door before sitting on my bed, and I growled under my breath. Just then, the door was thrown open, and my mom was standing there with a glare on her face. Before I could say anything, she walked over to me and grabbed me by the ear, which caused me to cry out in shock. We're going to the doctor, and you're not going to argue with me, or I'm grounding you until you're 60. Mom shouted. Then she took me outside and shoved me into the car, and I noticed she didn't have her apron on anymore. Please, Mom. I was cut off by another one of her glares, and I looked away as we were driving. I looked out the window, rubbing my burned cheek. I was trying to think of who that little girl was. Both of us were in the main doctor's office area a few minutes later, and I rubbed my aching ear. Then I was called back into the checkup area, and Mom told me she would stay back here and listen to the doctor. When I got there, 
The assistant told me to wait in the room until the doctor came, and I nodded. But right when the lady left, I got up and then ran out of the room and silently walked down the hall, hoping no one would see me. I ran down the hall until I found a door open, and I ran into the room. I went into the empty checkup room, and then I shut the door and sat on the checkup bed. I can't take this anymore. I just can't, I said, breathing heavily. I then stuck my hands in my jacket pocket, stopped, and then pulled it out. I opened my hand, and sitting in my palm was a pleasure cigarette. How the heck? I didn't have one in my pocket. I said in a shocked tone. I reached into my other pocket and pulled out a hidden lighter. I knew it was mine because it had a basketball picture on the front. Do it. A voice hissed into my ear. I then remembered what that little girl had said. Only one a day. I figured out that it must have meant only one of these strange cigarettes a day. But I felt weary as I looked at the cigarette. My head started hurting, and I felt like passing out. Suddenly, the door opened, and I looked up and saw a doctor standing there, looking at a clipboard. And when she looked up, she made eye contact with me. Who are you? The lady asked. I jumped and the cigarette flew out of my hand, and then I looked at the lady and didn't know what to say. Get her. A voice hissed into my ear. Suddenly, I jumped at the doctor, and she screamed out in fear and shock. But I covered her mouth and grinned at her. Darkness covered my face. Be quiet. They won't care if you die. I said in a dazed voice. I took my hand off the lady's mouth and then headed for her neck, starting to choke her. Please let me go, young man. Please let me go. The lady said, sounding worried. Just then, the door burst open, and a few security guards and a different doctor were in the room. I looked up at them, and everyone gasped in shock and surprise. And one of them commented, His eyes are black. Young man, stop this nonsense right now, the other doctor shouted. A few hours later, I was back at home, lying in bed. I felt sick, and that's what the doctors told me. I had actually thrown up twice, and Mom had made me hot tea to calm down my throat, but it only made me feel worse. Mom came into the room to check my temperature, and she was shocked. You're burning up. I have no clue what's happening. Maybe you're getting a virus, and that's why you're acting so strange, Mom explained. Mom, there's something I need to tell you. I said, sounding weak. What is it, honey? Do you feel better? Mom asked me. I actually... I stopped and grabbed my head in pain. I screamed in pain, too. My mom gasped and ran over to the side of the bed, telling me to calm down. I tried, and I actually did fall asleep. Suddenly, I awoke and jumped up, heading into the bathroom. I felt like I needed to throw up. I got to my toilet, and I let it out. When I was done, I wiped my mouth, and when I looked down, I gasped. It was pure black, like the goo that had come out of the girl's mouth. And then, it came out again. And then something else came out of my mouth, and I looked down into the toilet, and my eyes went wide in shock. I pulled a tooth out of the toilet bowl, and I stood up. I felt inside my mouth and felt the missing spot where the tooth had come from. What the... I said, sounding completely terrified. I ran into my room and then noticed my drawer, my sock drawer. I opened it. The cigarette box was gone. I looked around and then noticed the cigarette box was on my bed. I ran over to it, grabbing it. When I looked inside, I noticed there was only one left. I then grabbed my lighter, and I had an idea. I headed downstairs and out of the house. I didn't hear my mom shout my name, and then I stopped at the corner, and I grabbed the cigarette. 
one more. I said, grinning darkly. I then lit it and sucked the good stuff from the cigarette. And when I blew it out of my mouth, I laughed. But it was a dark laugh coming from my mouth, and I didn't care. It felt too good to stop. Then I threw down the cigarette and stomped it out with my bare foot. It burned. I didn't care. I just stood there thinking about something, and I shoved the empty pack into my pocket. It's time. I mumbled under my breath. I then noticed a big 18-wheeler was headed down the road near where I was. And then, without thinking about it, I walked into the middle of the road and stood there with my back to the truck. Everyone will be happy, I said, feeling better about my life and everything else. I heard the horn from the truck but didn't turn around or do anything. I just stood there, ready to die. Then I blacked out, and I felt my mind and feelings slip away from me. I felt the ground beneath me. I was probably dead. I groaned under my breath, and when I opened my eyes, I was staring at a ceiling, and the lights were blinding me. He's awake, I heard someone say. When I opened my eyes, I saw my mother and two police officers standing there smiling gently at me. What's going on? I asked as I sat up in the hospital bed. You're lucky to be alive, young man. You apparently walked out in the middle of the street and almost got hit by a truck, one of the police officers said. The doctors and EMTs found a box of cigarettes on you called Pleasure, Mom said, sounding concerned. I then told everyone in the room what had happened to me while messing with the pleasure cigarettes. Well, we actually found out that those cigarettes had an experimental drug in them, and you were the first victim of it, the other cop explained. A few days later, I was out of the hospital, and I was sitting in the living room when I smiled. I had actually quit smoking for the first time, and I actually felt happy. I looked over and saw my mom reading a book. The doorbell rang, and both of us looked at each other, puzzled. I got up and headed to the front door, and when I opened the door and looked around, no one was there. I then looked down and noticed something on the ground. It was a bottle of wine. I picked it up. Glamour, the bottle said. Jack, who is it? Mom asked. The only sound heard was the sound of a wine bottle being opened.